Click it. Do I need to click it? Here. I'll put it here. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name's Pinder Wong. I'll be your host and MC for the next day and a half. Um, just some administrative notes. We're gonna begin actually at two. Can I ask your phones to please on, be on silent or ringer? Um, it's my pleasure uh, to ask for the uh, opening address. Uh, this will be by the Honorable Nicholas W. Yang, JP, the mm -hmm. advisor to the Chief Executive on Innovation and Technology of the Hong Kong SAR government. So Nicholas, please. Well, I hope you enjoy the lunch and, uh, and a nice uh, so-called rest for some of the people who attended this morning session. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not in my geek outfit, okay, because I'm going to catch a flight to Israel with the chief executive in about 20 minutes. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. And, uh, and dear Pinder, distinguished guests, and uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm honored to be here today among old and new friends to open and welcome everyone to this public conference on smart contracts for smart cities. For those who come to Hong Kong overseas, welcome to Hong Kong. Okay, I hope you enjoy Hong Kong immensely. Let me start with two questions, which some of you attending this first blockchain workshop in Asia may have already asked. The first question is, if you knew how transformative the internet was going to be in 1993, take the time back, how could you have positioned your business and society to exploit the internet at that time? Now we all know that blockchains and smart contracts are part of a new platform, technology, and innovation that many believe will again be truly transformative. So my sec second question is, will this platform be a bigger opportunity than the internet on which it is built? Okay, think about that. I think uh, this will be like, a, I'm not gonna give you the answer, okay? So I don't have the answer, in fact. But uh, I think some of you have the answer here. And then maybe you're capable of finding the answer here. You know, if innovation and technology could diversify the economy, provide wider and better employment opportunities, and enhance the competitiveness and growth of the economy. We all know that. But at the same time, innovation and technology can also improve people's quality of life and help on social development. Hong Kong has the essential ingredient for nurturing innovation and technology development. We have a well-established legal infrastructure, an intellectual property protection regime, safeguard the interests of inventors and innovators. Our world-class infrastructure and international connectivity facilitates the flow of talent, idea, and knowledge. Our business community is trusted, and I emphasize the word trusted. Around the world, our education system produces talent who are creative and technology savvy, and our financial sector is one of the best in the world for providing competitive financial services and in raising capital. However, in order to take this innovation and technology development to the next level, we must invest in building an innovation and technology ecosystem in Hong Kong. And developing such ecosystem require continued commitment and investment and collaboration among the government, industry, academic and research sectors as represented by the audience of the blockchain workshop and the conference. 
Hong Kong's people are known for their agility and resilience. Over the past decades, Hong Kong faced many daunting challenges, that, but we always managed to overcome them with great flares and colors. For example, in 1967, Hong Kong had a big riots all over the territory, blood on the street. Yet the Hong Kong people emerged from this dark historical experience and became, became one of the Asia's four little dragons in terms of economic achievements in the 70s and 80s. And we call this the Hong Kong 1.0 wave. In the mid 1980s, after mainland China started its economic reform, another huge challenge hit Hong Kong. With the low cost labor and favorable government policy, the Pearl River Delta suck away Hong Kong's lifeblood in manufacturing. There was once a time 40% of our GDP was in manufacturing. Today, that's less than 2%. The once thriving manufacturing sector of Hong Kong all migrated across the border and hollow out Hong Kong, leaving hundreds of thousands of workers in the manufacturing sector, sector without a job and probably without a future. Yet, Hong Kong reemerged again by transforming itself into a service economy with over 90% of its total employment in the service business, including financial services, trading and logistic, professional services, and tourism. And we call this the Hong Kong 2.0 wave. And we all know that after the year 2000, the evolution of the internet has brought disruptive changes to the service industry. New platforms and business models have replaced traditional ones. New and powerful competition have emerged. Hong Kong must transform itself again. I do, I do believe Hong Kong will transform itself successfully again. This time from a service economy to a knowledge-based economy. And in doing so, Hong Kong must become a leading smart city in the process. I will call this the Hong Kong 3.0 wave. And I welcome to join to build this wave. When I first met Pinder, Pinder a few months ago, his vision on smart contracts excited me tremendously. I would like to thank Pinder in bringing the blockchain workshop to Hong Kong. We are here to discuss how Hong Kong, as part of China, can best position its businesses, society, and government to make the best practical use of this fundamental decentralized digital ledger innovation, which builds an internet of trust. Today's conference represents the first critical step of Hong Kong's participation in building the global standard framework of smart contracts. We all know that standard and platform are the ultimate successes of innovation and technology. I also believe that the collaboration we're forming here today will be an outstanding addition to the innovation and technology ecosystem we are all trying to build for Hong Kong. And I'm sure that in the future, we can all sit down and reflect back on how Hong Kong 3.0 became a reality and how the initial initiative today has contributed to this enormously successful transformation. So, to end my speech, here's the bright future of smart contracts and for smart cities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicholas, um, for sharing those inspiration remarks. Um, and thanks also to our many sponsors who have made this uh, smart contract initiative, which only began a few months ago, from really theory this would be nice to have uh, into actual practice. And so with that, in alphabetical order, I would like to thank our sponsoring organizations, Brian Cave, the Hong Kong Computer Society, Hong Kong Science, Technology and Parks, the Hong Kong Software Industry Association, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology School of Engineering, the Hong Kong Wireless Technology Industry Association, Internet Society of Hong Kong, the Internet Professionals Association, Perkins Coe, and our media partners in exchange. Thank you very much. So with that, I would like to hand over to Primavir uh, Primavir de Filippi, 
uh, and Constance Choi to open the conference with their opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it is a pleasure to, to be in Hong Kong. Um, just a really short overview of the blockchain workshop. This is an initiative that uh, we, we created together with Constance uh, back in January at uh, Harvard with a small conference of around 50 people. Uh, the conference just kept growing and um, we had the second edition at Stanford then uh, yet a third edition in London, and now finally we are here. So um, this is an ongoing um, uh, effort. Uh, we are a, a global uh, community. And um, so every, every edition has its own topic. Uh, we've been exploring the different uh, aspects of blockchain, trying to distinguish ourselves uh, from the traditional Bitcoin um, conferences and um, for, uh, for Hong Kong we decided that uh, we would actually address the concept of smart contract for smart cities uh, mainly because of like the interest also that Pindar had expressed in this so um, Um, like Priya Vera said, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. We, um, uh, we started out at Harvard and MIT. We took the conversation then to the West Coast, and we knew that this is really a global technology for a global community. So slowly, we've been trying to make our way to Asia, and here we are today at the fourth edition. So um, you know, this, this organization has been um, a, a collaboration in evolution, just like the technology is. Um, you know, we realized from our little small group of lawyers and technologists and entrepreneurs that it takes, it really takes a village, it really takes a diverse set of, of stakeholders to address this kind of technology, which really cuts at the heart of finance, our economics, our social order, um, our governance processes. So it's really exciting to be here. We, we really couldn't do it without you and especially with, the, with our supporters. So, um, so with, without further ado, we'll, um, we'll start the conference. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you, Koala, for existing. Uh, again, uh, and thank you very much also to the Cyberport, who's actually without which we would not have been able to host this event. So I would now like to win, uh, welcome Henning Dietrich, who will be doing the opening keynote, which is Towards a Democracy of Devices. Welcome, Henning. Thanks. Okay, so I'm Henning Dietrich, I'm from IBM. I'm working blockchain stuff there. Uh, different, uh, pretty uh, deep technical things. And uh, for this talk though, I'm trying to give a primer in a non-technical way, uh, shunning all the stuff that uh, we're actually um, juicing each other with um, uh, in, the, in the workshops, for example and try to um, make, uh, give, give a good idea what uh, this really means. Uh, smart cities, smart contracts, blockchain, and some other um, buzzwords that you might have heard. Thanks a lot for having us. Hong Kong is really fascinating. Um, this is a bit of a flying circus, um, the workshops that we're having here, and I can say that being here in Hong Kong is uh, no less impressive than being at Stanford or London. Um, I'm really so positively surprised and there's great hospitality extended here to us. Thank you a lot for that. So um, if we talk about smart cities, then maybe it's good to start the conversation um, from the goals. Who are the smart citizens that we are actually building for and what is smart here? How do we ground the possibilities of technology 
with what people actually want and need to, need to lead better lives. To me, cities actually have something scary, always. All the windows, and these are windows in Berlin, or could be in Berlin, where I come from, they scare me. Who lives behind those windows? Is there even anybody living there? Isn't there enough space even on the streets if, anybody, if everybody would come out of the houses and be in the street at the same time? And am I the only one asking that question, or is that coming from something that's not even personal and that many people might be sharing? I was born in Berlin when it was actually quite empty because of the Cold War. Many people had left because it was dangerous. And from my father's side, I'm a first generation urban citizen. My father was a soldier's son and his father was the son of the baker in a little village. And life is very different in a small village. You know people. And I also discovered, searching for my own sense of place, that the only place where I really actually feel at home is at sea, with no land at the horizon. And it's actually the water that makes Hong Kong so beautiful to me. But the city as we have today is not inherently a likable place. There are often no means for that right now. Most of our forefathers moved to the city to evade poverty, or because they had to sell their land or did not inherit any. In Hong Kong especially, war and revolution and rapid industrialization drove people here and giant projects were the blessing that got them out of the shanty towns that they first built. But we are not far removed from a life form in the city where it was all about surviving. And that's what city life often looks like, that people may not know what they miss. It doesn't really make it less of a loss. I never lived in a village that we are in a rat race, that we never have time, that we miss something, that something is off. I hear that sentiment shared quite often. What I find missing in cities is usually the sense of place. And Hong Kong is almost an exception here because of the water and the hills. It is way more defined by nature than most cities. But often everything in a city is fabricated not grown. Sometimes you don't see anything other than man-made um, that could be anywhere on the globe. Everything outgrow of an investment decision or government planning or corporate design. People are deprived of the expression of what they shape their environment into. Instead, it is being shaped for them and concrete resists tempering. The cities we build are man-made, but are they made for men? There's one very strong exception to me with that lack of place in cities, and that's the Athens Acropolis. This for me is really a place. Standing up there, you have this very strong sense of place. Maybe in part because I visited there when I was young with my family, and I recall how my father haggled with a flute seller, and he insisted to have that flute that he was playing on, and I still have it. But looking down from the Acropolis, into the hills and into the city around it gives you a massive feeling of you are at a certain specific location and not just somewhere. And what a place that is. Not only are the ruins around you a thousand years old, actually blown to pieces only quite recently when warfare became powerful enough to make that possible, but this is the place where democracy was first invented and practiced. It was unintentional as with many great inventions. After some power plays, all of a sudden the real power rested with the elected body of Athens, although nobody had really meant it to end up there. And it worked quite well, for a bit. There was a highly centralized society that at some point demonstrated that it performed better in the essential metrics back then, war. But we don't praise much of Sparta's culture, except calling poor things euphemistically Spartan. While Athens is forever one with arts, philosophy, the rule of law, and democracy. We live in quite Spartan cities today. They foster anonymity rather 
and community through the use of space. They foster competition rather than union, loneliness rather than company, separation into individual family units rather than generations living together. They are the result of strong pressures, economic pressures, and time shortage. Who has time to commute to the countryside every day? Our cities, for most, are quite poor in time and in money. It all works like it is now, Spartan, centralized, dictated by strong companies and authorities, but the blockchain will allow for a new way of interacting that reestablishes possibilities we lost when we started to leave the village. It will not bring back the cozy aspects of village lives, or maybe it will, the essential values of it. So when we talk about smart contracts, there are standard examples, like the fridge that refills itself with food when it realizes you're running low on something. The exciting possibility with the blockchain is that you could have it have a budget of virtual currency and go out and shop the internet, buy the stuff, and order it delivered all autonomously. I believe to be is a certainty that we will see self-driving, self-owning taxis who are small companies to themselves paying for the garage services and petrols themselves with some form of Bitcoin. We might have self-sufficient, fully self-owning hotel buildings, which control their employees via Yelp feedback and also are at the heart of it an autonomous corporation. And who then owns machines that no one owns? Maybe the profits will continue to concentrate in a few. Maybe they will be understood as common goods. Future traffic systems, superhighways, automatic vehicles, airlines, we will see superhighways and drones traffic on invisible lanes zipping through the skies. And smart contracts will also play an enormous role to help negotiating rights of way for drones, for example, in real time, but also fares and what roads to build in the first place. We might see the personalized ads from Minority Report as huge as Blade Runner. Information can save lives, literally. Medical records, access controlled by the patient, but accessible from anywhere, will soon be viewed as indispensable as hygiene. And all this will shape how cities will look in the future. But that is not enough. So imagine two people making love. And they're quite ecstatic. And they want to come together because they feel that increases the likeliness to have a child. Now, usually that story is told as a story of two generals wanting to raid a city together. And I guess that's less controversial, so I tell that in that way, which says a lot about our condition of human culture. Can we get smart and make love, maybe? Not war. Can we all progress? Can we prosper? Can smart contracts help with that? But so it doesn't get embarrassing, I'll switch to those generals. Instead of making up a scenario where one of the lovers proposes being ready and whispers to the other but isn't sure if the other heard it or is just incapable of answering, and so the answer is demanded again, but it comes so silently that our lover is not sure what it meant and ask again, and now it gets annoying already, and it's all over. And The point here is, it's not easy to reach consensus. And it's really a blessing. Humans can look each other into the eyes and understand that they were understood. But computers don't have that. When two communicate, they can never know if the other got the message or the message was maybe lost or the other side crashed and rebooted blanks and sending an acknowledgment. Every acknowledgment of a message could also get lost and this becomes a vicious circle from which, for computers, there's no escaping. They can, in fact, never know with any certainty that at any point in time, they're truly in sync with another computer. There are only probabilities, and that's a very hard problem. It's called the Byzantine General's problem, and it plagues every distributed system. Many approaches have been designed and have been successful in tackling it, but it cannot be solved once and for all, like quantum physics, once you have more than two processes, everything becomes a science of probability rather than solid facts. 
And that is, a m that is massively at odds with what you expect from computers. Now, it's quite interesting that it's not called the lover's problem, because in a way, loving and knowing each other is the way to overcome the extent existential notion that every man is an island. Computers will always fail at that. But now, there's the blockchain. And that comes pretty close. I believe we stand in front of something huge. It's so big we can't really see it, way bigger than the technological trick that makes it possible. It's hard to comprehend in two ways. For one, for its consequences that we will benefit to try to envision. And second, for its technical basics where there are many misunderstandings around. And these misunderstandings are far spread and create an echo chamber. People try to get oriented, get wrong facts, get irritated, and there's no central authority to educate people. It's a very democratic process, very free and malleable, and everybody's entitled to have an opinion. So there's no one to call the quarks out because anyone shooting could be a quark himself. There are few reputations established in this domain Efforts like blockchain workshop, Koala, and col collaborations with academic research universities are trying to change that. There are derivative reputations where a big brand like IBM steps in the game and you hope the stuff they are saying and writing by their smart guys is something you can rely on. IBM is famous for infighting though. People protect their turf, people like to shoot messengers you don't know, you can trust. So what do you do? Process it all yourself. And by the way, that's exactly how the blockchain works. The blockchain doesn't solve the hand and egg problem itself, but the blockchain introduces something that we call trustless. That means no one can bullshit you and everyone else, everyone else makes sure in passing that you can't get fooled. This works only with hard facts, hard facts that you can express digitally, like money, digitally signed deeds, contracts, goods, certificates, and all that while no one has to trust anybody else's word. And the trick is very simple. Everyone is, in fact, processing it all themselves. It's the equivalent of you learning all about a hard topic so you can know who tries to bullshit you. It's the least economic way to compute anything. All computers in your network in a blockchain do the exact same instead of complementing each other in a shared workload. And to me, I think this is AI right there. It doesn't look as expected. It looks brute force-like. But the blockchain, for hard facts, make it impossible for anyone to fool you because you simply check every last bit of what the claim is by computing everything exactly the same way. And everybody else in the network does that too. And that's a blockchain. Now we've done that work together. We've synchronized our brains. And I, right in this moment, I'm proposing a logical conclusion step by step. And you, like another computer, process them and convince yourself that, in fact, the logic behind it is true. And then after me, the next speaker comes and proposes the next block of knowledge. Some transactions of insight. So that metaphor sounds surprisingly social then, right? It doesn't really feel trustless, but very communicative. But it also is really trustless in the sense that you aren't asked to believe my logic, but I have to make the case by laying out the building blocks. Now the blockchain has one big advantage. While rhetorics might be deceiving, the calculations in a blockchain are exact. There are no two opinions. Well, actually, there are no two pins about the logic. The nodes of blockchains can't be fooled about basic math. One and one is two. But if one node insists one and one was four, well, the result of that would simply be it would be ignored by all the other nodes. It kicks itself out of what's called the consensus. So every node checks what one one is and finds it's two. 
and they disregard whatever was proposed based on the assumption that one and one was three. So here the analogy with human beings fails. The blockchain is based on math, and there's no additional type of green that could be debated. However, what can happen is that the network fails, and some nodes start talking among themselves only over here, and some others over there, and they don't even realize the community has split. And that also ends the consensus among them. So one group will have consensus about what the truth is among themselves, and the other group hasn't even heard what they debated over in the other corner. Now, that can always happen. That's a huge problem. And we are in the middle of hot research this year of what to do there. There are accepted ways to do it now. Bitcoin propo proposed an ingenious way, and that's what makes it a success. But it's far from a perfect solution. In fact, it can lead to very poor results sometimes. And I won't go deeper at this point, but I will say that there are problems that are not solved yet. And I have yet to be convinced of an approach that will work. I've also been in situations where that is regarded an implementation detail. Well, it isn't. That's like saying we really know we want fusion reactions to solve our energy challenges. And we have the smartest minds working in it, so it will happen soon, since a couple of decades. But while there's overreach, let's look at what we have and why I think this could be called AI. There's the term AI effect, and it means that we have this ungrateful habit of denying anything the label of AI that actually exists. We feel we'd know AI if we met it, but nothing we have now passes that test. And what is really playing out is that there's a bias that AI is science fiction, and nothing that really exists could possibly also be science fiction, right? But I think it's important to appreciate the rainbow shine of CDs and the blue glow of a reactor bath. This stuff really looks and works like you thought it should. Science fiction come real. And I think that's not celebrated enough. And what we have here with the blockchain is something that would have been impossible to achieve only 10 years ago. Computers were just not fast enough, at least consumer computers. The concept is inherently wasteful, which means it will only get stronger while computers get, keep getting more powerful. And we just didn't have the hardware to run it earlier. So while it could have been invented earlier, it would not have been possible to run it. It's not like a melody that could have been invented and sung at any time in, his his in the history of mankind. It's really only right now. But the heart of the matter is what we see here is an emergent feature, and one that is modeled pretty closely on how human brains work. Not one brain, but many brains in concert. And who thinks you could grow up to be sane-minded without the social fabric of other minds around you? It has been tried. The children died. So this network of electronic processors, the blockchain, mimics something else that we expected to create intelligence. It doesn't deal with becoming the self-aware single brain. It apes the way we synchronize with our environment, the minds around us. And from that, we don't get self-awareness as holy grail, but we get something else. So let's play chess. What would we logically come to expect what we should get when we successfully model one special aspect of the mind, namely the way how it checks if it's being told the truth or not. That part where you think something fell through yourself to find if you agree. And again, you might lose the picture now because it seems so simple. But that is what the blockchain is, and it is new. IBM mainframes and space shuttles did something similar, but they were more or less just constantly second-guessing themselves, not controlling what someone else fed them. In the blockchain, that is what happens. It controls if it is told the truth. Now, what you get is something that can't be fooled, paired with the exactitude of a computer that knows basically only zeros and ones, and not ever one and a half, and that is important. We, as human beings, usually talk about interesting things, or try to. Computers are bookkeepers. And the AI we're talking about here is not the philosophical cyberware type, but it is one that can't be fooled. And good for finance. Boring content, but unfoolable. That's that. You get a computer that is still primitive in what it can do, but it cannot be fed wrong information. That is actually mind-boggling. 
and is about to put a lot of professions out of business. And that is leveraged for commerce, just like the internet revolutionized the media industry. So the blockchain is a method to get computers to agree. This is a very hard problem, and the blockchain solves this, initially giving us virtual currency, independent of any bank or government. Since money is around for quite a bit, and it has the most profound impact on our societies, that is something. We can expect that this new evolution of it, of money, will have far-reaching consequences. Or can we? Will it be all co-opted by banks? Or governments? Can it be co-opted at all? For individual profit or shared pros prosperity? There are multiple successful local currencies through the ages, up to modern times, usually after the collapse of central government, but the central authority ended them as fast as it regained the power. Will Bitcoin go the same way? That is possible. But it doesn't matter. Because the automatic intelligence we have found in its basic principles is useful for many things in commerce beyond payment and cryptocurrency. However, and that is important and part of this, having cryptocurrency in the mix makes commerce founded on blockchain really powerful. People try to wiggle around it because they don't want to be associated with the dirt of Bitcoin, with the shadiness associated with the term cryptocurrency. So this stuff is called virtual currency or digital assets, but those are fig leaves. You either have cryptocurrency with your smart contracts or you have neutered the whole concept. Just trust me on that. For the sake of brevity, I won't go into this here. This would not be a valid transaction on the blockchain map. But at this point, a problem to the blockchain also has comes into play. To provide trustlessness, you have to share every detail every time. If you don't, the other parties cannot make up their own minds. That is not allowed in a blockchain, and that makes it quite slow way too slow for many purposes, and that's being researched right now. How the mind sharing of computers can be restricted to where it makes sense, but it's not solved. And there should be something like I'm just asking you, just trust me, because it doesn't matter right now, but check it out later. And maybe because you felt what I said before made sense, you'll believe me now. And going forward, for now, assume this might be true. Maybe you only check fact the checks, maybe here and there, and you'll rely on your peers in the audience to find me out the other times. If everyone fact-checks something, then on the whole, that should mean everything is fact-checked. And if something is wrong, Peter Todd will sound the alarm. <laughs> and that's actually one approach to scale the blockchain. And again, it looks quite human, what is going on there, and you wonder if that is coincidental. Now, just very briefly, not in detail, what is a smart contract? A smart contract is basically when you let a program run this way. It runs on all computers at the same time. All computers do the exact same thing and come to the same results, ideally, so they all agree what the results of the program is. And when that program can move virtual currency from one virtual account to another, then all computers in the node will agree that it did that, and that money will effectively have moved. The implications of that are huge. But it basically allows to create virtual currencies, fully automated markets that work somewhat like stop-loss stock exchange bots. And it cuts out middlemen that make a living by providing markets with trust. Intermediaries who provide escrow, money transfer, banking. It will enable new forms of wealth, jobs, and opportunities to create real value. So here's a question that's super important. I get ask that a lot, and it's fair to ask that in every context where people talk about blockchain. What is a blockchain needed for in IoT? This is a question many people ask, and many mistakenly believe the answer is none. But the answer is simple, and it's all about the automatic market that smart contracts allow you to create. Because what this allows us is fully automated commerce, 
between entities that cannot trust each other without a middleman who does. And the point here is what actually happens on the ground in IoT with or without blockchain, you might not be able to discern. Because how does a highway look different in a dictatorship or in a democracy? It doesn't. How does a ship look different? It does not. Or a plane? It doesn't. Buildings look the same in a democracy or in a dictatorship. So what is it? The point is, democracy has a very complex overhead. It requires institutions, procedures, process. And there's a lot of negotiation going on when you don't have a central command. But therefore, for many things, this is much more efficient and sustainable for humans. And these negotiations are what the blockchain can do for IT. It's not the actual action. Whatever these things actually do then, once they've concluded what they want to do together, once things are worked out, that is the same as before. But it's about who has the control. And it's all not too hard when you go for a centralized command. But as we have seen, that is often too rigid for growth. And to make something possible that were not possible before, empowering devices to take part in a democracy of things. And why would we want that? Well, there are many reasons. Trust, agency, sustainability. If we talk about smart contracts, smart cities and buildings, there's a little anecdote. This building there, people in Florence forgot when it was actually built. Many thought it was from the times of the Romans, as old as the Pantheon in Rome. In fact, it wasn't. It was built only a thousand years ago, not 2,000 years. Can we imagine that a smart building that is run by a centralized company could last that long? Or shouldn't we find a way to make the smart components of a building decentralized and not depending on a single entity? Then maybe we will be able to build something that can last as long as these buildings. Will we be able to achieve this kind of sustainability? Or will we need to build things that are self-sustained and resilient and can take part in the ever-changing song and dance around them out of their own accord? Reprogrammable for certain, just like new paint will be necessary every now and then on concrete, but everything that is in bronze and marble will just need a little shining. How about building software that is that powerful and long-living to accommodate things that are with us, often so much longer than a generation or two. With that, I'm closing. Thank you, Henning. That's, that was beautiful. Can I ask you to remain on stage because we're moving right. That was, uh, I'm speechless. Not often I'm speechless, but that, that was one of them. Thank you very much for that. So right now we're going to move on to stage two, blockchain and its applications. And I would like to invite uh, on the stage, uh, you heard Peter Todd. So Peter, can you please come up here? Bitcoin Core Dev, associated with uh, Dominic Williams. Thank you. If you could join from uh, Definity, uh, Vlad Zamfir. Vlad, are you here? Please. And Vesilek, please, the inventor of Ethereum. And uh, Henning, you are to moderate us, so please riff off your own keynote, if you can do that. <laughs> Cheers yeah, sure. So first of all, thanks a lot of you guys coming here. And um, I'd like to tell the audience that it's, it's really an honor for me to moderate this panel, because um, we are trying to be non-technical, as non-technical as possible. And that's going to be a total waste, because you have uh, you have the brain power of the Bitcoin and, and, and uh, Ethereum community on stage here. And, and one more. Yes, awesome. Um, now we're going to have to do some sharing. So that's going to work. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay, so my first question is um, um, introducing yourselves maybe, and uh, I would like to start with Peter. 
um, telling us a little bit about yourself and how you navigated, how you found Bitcoin. Yeah, so um, right now I do uh, work as a decentralized consensus consultant and uh, I also go work on the Bitcoin Core software. Uh, how I got into there though was kind of a bit convoluted. Uh, way early off in high school, I remember reading Adam Back's Hashcash paper and at the time my dad worked as an economist and I think I spent the next six months bothering him with my crazy schemes for how to turn this into a virtual currency. Absolutely none of which had any possibility of ever, ever working. And then uh, many, many years later, of course, around late 2009, I finally read the Bitcoin paper and immediately thought to myself, shoot, that's what I should have done. <laughs> and, if, you know, my experience was actually not unique there. I mean, lots and lots of cryptographers kind of had that reaction. So, you know, I got interested and kept looking at it and eventually started contributing. Okay, thanks a lot. So, um, Vitalik, um, what, uh, telling us a little bit about your background and what, why Ethereum? Um, I mean, I've been in the, the blockchain, crypto, whatever you want to call it, space for about four and a half years now. Uh, found out about Bitcoin first from my dad. At that point, I ignored it because I thought there's it had no intrinsic value. There's no way no way it would survive. Then three weeks later, I heard about it again from the internet. And I thought the internet's pretty trustworthy. I should probably look into it more. <laughs> <laughs> um, then. Uh, Got in, uh, co-founded Bitcoin Magazine, um, eventually sort of progressed from spending a few hours a week on it to getting to the point where I realized I might as well just drop out of school and go, and go into the space full time. And at some point about two years ago, I realized that uh, people were, this people at some point started to realize that you can use blockchains for things other than money. And they started creating these protocols that were, where people are basically saying, you know, hey, you can, you can do gambling on the blockchain. Let's like make a more complex protocol with a feature for that. Hey, you can do financial derivatives on the blockchain. Let's add a feature for that. And people were creating these sort of complicated Swiss Army knife protocols with 55 transaction types. I worked for one for a few weeks. So I invented at least two or three transaction types for it. Um, eventually, I realized that during the eight months that I was at university, the one thing that they taught me about was programming languages. And it just naturally made sense that instead of having 55 different, you know, and basically instead of like having 55 different types of pocket calculators, you might as well have a smartphone, you know, create a general purpose platform that can support anything. And, you know, that's what Ethereum is. That's what I've been working on to this day. Okay, thank you. Um, Vlad, I mean, if you would continue, how did you come to the field? What's your background? What are you working on at Ethereum right now? Sure, so um, I have less of a history in the field than, the, than these veterans. Um, I've been working in the field for a, a little over a year and a half uh, with Vitalik as a fantastic educator and mentor. Um, you know, crypto is my addiction. I work on consensus protocols and I, um, you know, spend a lot of my waking hours thinking about blockchains and the implications and architecture choices and all of the complexities and details that go with it. Can you describe a little bit what you're working on with Casper? Sure. So I'm working on a consensus protocol called Casper. It's a proof of stake consensus protocol that uses uh, security deposits as opposed to mining hardware to secure the consensus. Basically, um, these consensus protocols use economics to make sure that um, so an adversary can't overwhelm the, the network with computers. Um, and the way Bitcoin does this is by using the fact that computers have bounded computational power. Uh, proof of stake consensus protocols use digital assets that are defined inside the consensus as the anti-civil mechanism. Um, so what is that addressing? Why, why is there a need for that? Yeah. Sorry to get too technical already. <laughs> uh, the, the, it, it means that the, the blockchain will have like a much lower electricity consumption in order to secure itself. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dominique. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, I first came across uh, crypto stuff back in 1998. Um, I had a startup and uh, I was implementing a certificate authority and I used this library that I got off the web uh, called Crypto++. It's still available. And it was very, very beautiful C++ code. And I sort of investigated the author a bit and he was called Wei Dai. And there was very limited information on this guy. Um, but I came across a paper he'd written called uh, Be Money which was one of the early Bitcoin-like proposals. And I absolutely loved it. Um, but one, you know, one, 
life goes on and I sort of forgotten about it and then Bitcoin um, you know broke onto the news and I was uh, I thought this is amazing you know this kind of things finally come to fruition so uh, at the time I was uh, running a games company and uh, I was actually um, working in sort of scalable distributed com computing um, with uh, scalable distributed computing tech because uh, I had several million users and I thought well you know maybe this decentralized tech can scale too and so I um, ended up thinking about that a lot and although I now work uh, uh, my co-founder of a fintech company called String um, working with synthetic assets uh, through uh, the Definity project um, I do a lot of uh, research into scalable blockchain techniques and technologies um, and that's why I'm here. So again, I mean, what is that addressing? What's the what's the main problem? So um, you know, Bitcoin, you know, kind of really, in, although if you're not familiar with the space, it can seem complex. It's really quite a simple system, and uh, you know, it, it can only process a few transactions a second. So with the current load on the network created by multisig, I think the the upper bound is sort of three tra three transactions a second. But if you think about, for example, the, in the Internet of Things, you know, some people predict there'll be 50 billion devices by 2020. And actually, we need our decentralized cloud to process hundreds of thousands or even millions of transactions a second. So uh, there's a very long way to go from the old sort of 2008 iteration of this technology to uh, what it needs to do in quite a short, uh, not, not too far in the future. Um, my um, my my view, having spent a huge amount of time working on this uh, in the area, is that act actually decentralized clouds can be made to scale indefinitely, and we'll be able to um, build pretty much any uh, large-scale IT system we want on top of the on, on top of the centralized cloud. So we know we'll see. Thanks. Uh, who here on the panel? Before I come to Pavel, thinks or is sure that uh, blockchain technology will be scalable? Show your hands, please. <laughs> Bitcoin blockchain. <laughs> Bitcoin blockchain. No, Define blockchain. blockchain technology. No, I won't. You can decide. I, mean, I, I, think that I think it's better to say um, cryptographic ledger technology because blockchain is one specific implementation. S so did I see that right? It was three out of five. I'm not sure if there's one particular use case of databases. <laughs> okay, I was just trying to understand where we are. Pavel. Um, Please introduce yourself and maybe uh, with a focus, if you want, on what you do using the blockchain. Mm -hmm. My name is Pavel Karavchenko. I'm from Ukraine, but I'm world citizen, so I travel a lot. Uh, my background is information security and cryptography specifically. Um, I studied it long before Bitcoin, and um, I was unlucky to haven't noticed Bitcoin early enough. So I joined the industry only like two years ago. But I was interested enough to deep, really dig into it. And I was really excited and I created like educational course about cryptocurrencies. I've conducted it already five times in different universities for free. And my career in blockchain industry started from Stellar. I was responsible for building a uh, hosted wallet and researching anonymity questions. And then anonymity interested me the most, and then I joined another startup that was intended to build an infrastructure where you can combine anonymity and KYC at the same time. So I saw this problem, and um, the outcome is that um, you are able to provide a proof in an efficient way that you are KYC by a certain authority without telling who you are exactly. So it kind of preserves privacy on top of public blockchain. And um, now I'm kind of looking at space from the perspective, okay, how financial industry can benefit from blockchain technology. So I believe that um, concept with shared distributed ledger is not the right thing for banking industry, just because of scalability issues. You just can't scale um, single blockchain to limits that are needed for fintech. And uh, I think that the global consensus is only needed when 
you operate in anonymous environment as Bitcoin or Ethereum or Ripple when validators are anonymous and they don't trust each other. So when you build trustless environment, in case of trusted environment, you need different approaches and probably you can apply these same techniques, but as a Lego in different form. So I'm currently building an open source protocol that wants to, needs to address this problem. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question that may be um, first going to you, uh, to everyone here actually. Mm -hmm. um, if you, when you try to explain consensus or blockchain, pick your mm -hmm. thing or cryptocurrency to people who are not technical, one runs into them every now and then. And what is your favorite metaphor, metaphor to, to convey in a non-technical way what it's all about? I usually provide an example with voting. So when basically when we vote for, for president, for example, we know who is voting, how many voters are, and they actually like, trust each other to some extent. And we still, like in countries like Ukraine, we still have not very good results with this voting process. And under these assumptions, when we all know each other, we know like amount of people who are voting. So basically Bitcoin blockchain solved the problem, how we can achieve a fair voting process under assumption that we don't know amount of voters at all. They are all anonymous and they don't trust each other. And basically the problem is solved. So this is consensus, how we can do that. Okay, thank you, great. Dominic? Um, Peter? Yeah, it's, a, it's a very nebulous thing, consensus actually. It's not easy, easy to explain and there are very many different ways of um, achieving it. So then Bitcoin achieves consensus in quite a simple way and uh, it's easily understood uh, by electricity consumption. Um, Satoshi came up with this idea that everybody would um, try and solve a puzzle. And whoever solved the puzzle, which is solved by brute force, uh, expenditure of electricity, could cast a deciding vote. And then a new puzzle would be set. And but, but whenever you solve a puzzle, you have to append it to a previous, the previously s s previous solution. And so what happens is uh, af after a while, you get a chain and the, the puzzles get buried deeper and deeper. And once you've had the puzzle buried maybe six, six deep, it's, it's you know, you've got a probability of approaching one that it's not going to change again in the future. It's going to be, it's going to remain in the chain. So, you know, the, the fundamentals behind Bitcoin are very simple. Um, people race to solve puzzles and whoever solves the puzzle first gets to cast a deciding vote and append a new puzzle in the form of a block of transactions or a puzzle solution rather to the chain. Okay, thanks. Peter? You know, I would go and... Uh there's really sort of two ways I end up explaining. One is to explain kind of how Bitcoin works. And I go talk about, you know, Ledger. I have this whole fancy story I have about, you know, Village where they all want to have money and et cetera. But I think in some ways a more useful explanation is actually to a slightly higher level, which is to programmers and people kind of working in the space who aren't familiar with this particular type of technology, which is to really ask the question, what does it take to change a record? and in many other systems that are based on trust. Well, to change a record, it's very hard to define how hard it is because all that has to happen is some people lose some cryptographic keys and suddenly an equally valid looking ledger appears. And I can be fooled into accepting one ledger versus another because it is purely based on trust. Whereas what proof of work technology does is it links this back to something very physical, something very concrete something that cannot be cheaply faked, which is energy. Can I, can I ask in the audience um, to please show your hands who feels that he got the connection between proof of work and Bitcoin? <laughs> okay, thank Not you. half bad. Huh? Not half bad. So for the rest of the audience, um, how would you describe in a non-technical way, what the connection is between proof of work and Bitcoin. What's the role in Bitcoin of proof of work? Yeah, Dominic had also talked about it, basically. Well, you know, I mean, again, this is something about trying to prevent a record from being changed. Um, maybe a somewhat more concrete example is, suppose I want to go and prove to the world 
the status of my business accounts. And I could go take those accounts and I could go and take out an ad in the New York Times and put those accounts directly in, the, in that ad. And if I go do this, you know, every quarterly report, I establish this record that is extremely hard to change. I want to go and fake the records from the prior year. Well, how am I going to do that? I mean, it's in the New York Times. It's in every single library around the nation. Do I go send out secret agents to sneak into those libraries and quickly, you know, change the copies? And that's kind of not unlike what Bitcoin is in the sense of this very well-defined thing that you'd have to change, which is to run a whole bunch of computers burning a ton of energy to make this new equally valid record. And in the case of the New York Times, you can talk about in terms of physical records sitting out in physical places. In the case of Bitcoin, we can talk about physical energy that's actually destroyed to do something. In the case of conventional computer systems where like I sign a digital signature, again, if I steal the keys, I can go change it at will. And it's not really clear what does it take to do that. Okay. Vitaly, um, a metaphor for blockchain, so crypto, whatever. And I actually just like our lead, uh, our lead developer, Gavin Wood's phrase, uh, the world computer. So, you know, it is this sort of magic computer in the sky. And in the 20th century, you would run a program on a computer. And in the 21st century, you would just run a program. And you don't really need to care about which computer it's on. It's sort of just running in the sky. And you know, everyone agree. Everyone sees the program running. Everyone agrees on the outcome. And it just so happens that that's an incredibly convenient way of building many, many kinds of interesting things. Thanks, Vlad. So I usually like to say that uh, the the whole question is kind of confused by the fact that Bitcoin invented two things: a type of consensus protocol and a way to make uh, network resistant to attack in a public way, um, which which I call economic consensus. So. Um, what I what I like to focus on is the fact that Bitcoin uses an uh, digital assets that are defined inside the consensus to secure the consensus. Now that requires you to already know what consensus is. You feel that that's you a metaphor? Uh, no, I don't feel that that's a matter <laughs> metaphor. Okay, um, let me I'm ask the question <laughs> again. I'm I'm, qu I'm quite bad with metaphors. Oh, um, really? Make a simile. Um, so you can pass. I can just say that. A blockchain is like coming to agreement. <laughs> <laughs> you had such a long time to think about an answer. <laughs> I'll, ask, I'll ask you that again. <laughs> okay, so real quick maybe, Vlad, you first this time. Um, what for you is the most important application for blockchain technology? Just one thing thrown out there and then Vitalik is next. Sure, I think um, censorship resistant uh, access to information is the most important application of blockchain. That sounds more like a building block. What's the concrete application? Something real that can be done with it. Um, and you want to, I mean, s like, so for example, uh, it's I really I I'm amazed you even have a real buddy. Then uh, Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like to be very general. Uh, but basically, if imagine being able to uh, find any file and be able to download it from a decentralized internet for like a small fee as opposed to having to trust centralized parties. Like in BitTorrent? Like in BitTorrent, only with the quality of Napster. Okay. Vitalik? The wh what's for you is the first thing or the most important thing that you feel is, is worked out as an application with blockchain technology? I mean, one of my yeah, sort of phrases that I've used a lot is basically that blockchain technology has no killer app. And you know what I mean by that is that I think that if there is sort of one particular pathway that c in that you know this kind of technology could use to generate sort of trillions of dollars of value for very for very many people, then there would realistically be a kind of specialized centralized service with sort of trust anchors along the way that does it already. So. I think where the benefits that we're really going to see are things that are kind of more subtle. So imagine kind of the difference between programming languages in the 1980s and programming languages now. There's nothing that programming languages now, th that programming languages now can do that programming languages in the 1980s can't do. But there are plenty of ways in which they're moderately more convenient. And 
I think in general, this idea of running applications on public world, on this sort of public world computers basically means that, I mean, first, first of all, you can, there are many, many di opportunities for different groups to, uh, to sort of th to run operations that interact with each other, and they can interact in a w in, a, in a way where they can completely trust each other. It's a kind you know there are many kinds of digital assets that you that you can put a, put on one of these uh, put on the world computer. You can make financial contracts off of those assets. You can kind of link at link assets together, trade uh, trade them, buy and sell buy and sell them. You can record events. You can potentially make contracts that trick that move assets around conditional on conditionally on particular events occurring. So, it's these sort of very subtle sort of combinatorial benefits that come from uh, sort of uh, to, to to a medium ex a medium extent from very 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 many places. Once we see kind of lots of things in the ecosystem at the same time. I'll try again to ask for a very concrete application that is the first that comes to mind. It doesn't have to be important or you don't have to defend it, but what's the first real application that comes to mind? Let's Locked face in. it, buying drugs over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, what's interesting about that is there's really two flip sides to blockchain tech. And I think uh, one of them is permissionless innovation. And believe me, being able to buy drugs over the internet is certainly permissionless. And if you are one of the dealers, you're certainly going to call it innovative. And then the other half is really actually pretty boring stuff about just better security, better auditing, better processes. And it's quite interesting how you kind of have this tipping point. And I think we kind of saw this in the development of financial tech where we had better and better and better crypto, but it was always still based on trust. You know, at some point, we were always had a trusted third party who ultimately called the shots. And if they failed, all this fancy crypto was useless anyway. You know, no matter how many digital signatures we throw at the problem, we're still trusting them. But you get to a point where you can remove that trusted third party, and suddenly the whole paradigm changes. It's the last little step, but that's the difference between a system that's just a better audited bank and a system that lets you do things that authorities don't want you to do. Dominic? Uh, well, you know, um, as someone as a co-founder of a fintech company, I hope that we can do better than you know um, enable uh, drug sales. But um, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, more more generally, um, I think it's. It, I mean, Vitalik covered a lot of the applications I'd have mentioned, but more generally, I think the uh, and the more concretely, the hid, the hidden benef the hidden benefit of uh, open systems is their openness, and uh, I'll explain why using a a story from Palo Alto, there was a company, um, I won't name, that um, grew very successfully. They were a kind of CRM product, and they looked inside your email box and they could uh, draw all kinds of organizational maps. Anyway, the product depended upon the LinkedIn APIs to work, right? And this company was gonna be a unicorn, it was gonna be worth billions of dollars, and then all of a sudden, I think it was about six months to nine months ago, L LinkedIn changed the rules governing access to its API, and they decided the only people who could access the LinkedIn API were Microsoft and Salesforce, right? And all of a sudden, this company that was gonna be a unicorn and gonna be worth billions um, was in a bind. You know, its whole product was gonna, was gonna fall apart in three months. So um, actually, it, it, it did okay. It managed to sell itself to Salesforce, but uh, it didn't sell for the billions that it thought it was gonna be able to sell itself for. Now. Um, if you think about uh, the decentralized cloud, because in the future we'll be able to implement anything in the decentralized cloud pretty much. So we can have a Gmail, we can have a LinkedIn. Now, if you were a business, would you prefer to build on top of an open LinkedIn, right? Or would you prefer to build on top of the closed proprietary LinkedIn that might capriciously change its mind at any time in the future, seek rent, do some deal that you couldn't predict and just put you out of business? So I think the reason that the decentralized cloud will win is that it's an open, transparent system. And once people can see that working, they'll always pr prefer to build on top of that rather than use um, proprietary systems that are run by I individual companies. Thank you. Pavel, as concrete as possible, what is the one thing that comes to mind? It'll be on pretty blockchain? obvious. I think the killer app for blockchain technology already exists. It's money. It's Bitcoin itself. It's a currency or digital asset with digital gold and we all use it. Um, the next one will be public infrastructure that is much better than existing one. And the next thing will be like 
permanent storage of financial history. Not only financial, but just recording of facts. That's it. Okay, cool. What, what is the opinion here? Um, I mean, I, I was on a hackathon. Uh, I was mentoring um, member uh, participants on a hackathon, and everybody uh, there chose Ethereum. Um, now we have a diverse panel here. Um, what do you feel is the most important blockchain right now, Pavel? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer first and say Dogecoin. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of um, innovation and money that is flowing, it's still Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, Dominic? Uh, Ethereum, because uh, blockchain, uh, sorry, Bitcoin is just a special case of a decentralized system. So it's much better to build a general purpose decentralized virtual computer and build all kinds of different things on top of it. Uh, it's trivial to implement a cryptocurrency on top of uh, Ethereum. So why do we need Bitcoin? And so I think that, you know, the innovation in the industry now is happen happening in the Ethereum space. And, uh, yeah, Peter, so what do you think about that? About that? I think you guys were all arguing about better, making better telephone systems. You know, I think the real uh, innovations to not put the logic in the system itself, but rather put the logic on the client side and make the actual decentralized consensus part as simple as possible. And to that extent, I would say Bitcoin's very nice because it is dead simple and it works and it has tons of money and computer power behind it. But that's not really the reason why I said that. It's because I think you can make very good systems where Bitcoin is not the thing that runs the logic. Uh, re I'll rephrase the question for you. Um, do you think there's good use for Bitcoin in the in an Ethereum world? Uh, well, the digital gold use case, I think, is certainly something that's going to keep popping up again and again. You know, there's always a chance that some any, some other country is going to go into hyperinflation. We'll see, like negative inflation, some ne negative inf uh, interest rates in the Eurozone, capital control somewhere. And, you know, there's clearly a need, people clearly have a demand for some kind of asset class that's a hedge against political risk. So far that's been gold, but, you know, who in, the, in the future, could I think if Bitcoin establishes trust in a couple of decades, that, you know, easily could be it. Um, I mean, I, so as far as, uh, you know, things more things that are more com more complex goes. I think technology is just going to conti continue improving, and the, the systems that win are going to be the systems that are most cap most capable of being friendly to ongoing innovation. Yeah, so I definitely think that Bitcoin is better for like transmitting value over the internet at the moment uh, than Ethereum, and I think that Bitcoin is a, a really really great educational example because it's it's a protocol that almost anyone, if they spend a day start wrestling with will be able to understand and it so it provides a really great gateway mm -hmm. to wanting to use blockchains and then ethereum is great because it's you know it's easier to use uh, and ease of use I think is really important for the rate of innovation so um, if you come to an application a concrete IOT application who here would feel um, comfortable to have a lock at a store that is controlled by blockchain what kind of blockchain? So, as, 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 <laughs> long as, the, <laughs> as long as the lock on the door checks the blockchain before it downloads a software upgrade and is fully certain that the software upgrade is getting is not tailored to my door, mm -hmm. then I would trust it. Mm. And you have a backup key, physical. So, aside from the no killer apps thing, by the way, another sort of popular opinion that I have is that I think no blockchain that, is curr that uh, currently exists is. Uh, sort of high good enough to satisfy a, a like na national scale usage for hundreds of millions of people. And that's basically because of the every computer processes, every transaction type of, uh, type of scalability concerns. So I think even from, from a technical standpoint, there's still a bit quite a bit of a roadmap to go before we can really start sort of rolling IoT out into every car in Hong Kong or, you know, or God forbid, mainland China. I mean, I'd make the point that I think a lot of interesting Internet of Things applications don't need consensus. Um, one of the more interesting ones I've actually seen recently is, funny enough, from agriculture, which is uh, in many places a wild boar, and they're kind of annoying because they go dig up your fields and eat all your plants. 
And well, what do you do about them? Well, why don't you go and put a trap and capture them? And what people end up doing is they go put these massive traps that funny enough, I mean, I remember watching the YouTube video and it's like, you know, like halfway through, oh, okay, this kind of interesting. And there was, wait a second, they're using a cell phone to go get live video the moment a motion sensor um, triggers to then figure out when's the exact right time to trigger this trap. It's like, hang on, that's actually Internet of Things. That's actually this really useful application. And it's not implausible to imagine, well, why don't we go outsource the human task of looking at the live video and figure out when to go hit the button and make the trap falls down and capture all these animals. And it's like, you know, that actually makes a lot of sense. This is actually a valid use case that people pay a lot of money to implement, but you need consensus now. And if you don't need consensus, you don't really need blockchains. In terms of things that do need consensus, I think Vlad actually had a great example of something that actually does make sense, which is validate software updates. But, you know, I think the overall Internet of Things story is not going to be that much about blockchains. I think it's going to be something much broader than that. Dominique, the original question was about door locks. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, decentralized cloud technology will be almost unrecognizable in five years, and we'll have no concerns, or probably far fewer concerns, about running your door off it. Okay. So, I th yeah, you have to look forward a little bit, but I, d I don't see there's going to be a problem in a few time. Pavel? I think the problem is not the technology, but rather like usability and human interfaces. So we already have a lot of technologies, but we just don't use them because they're too complicated for humans. So the challenge, as I see, is that to make them really understandable for your grandma. So she will not s die because of starving in front of fridge. <laughs> 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 Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I mean, <coughs> so y you're saying basically we have the technology, uh, we're just too stupid to use it. Well, just easy enough to use. Easy it enough has to, to be teach. made easier, there has to be education. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I find that interesting because I, I think we all agree that we're early. Um, uh, but as a last question, maybe, how early are we? I mean, is, is the, do, you, do you agree with Pavel that we have the technology, it's just about education now? No, I think the I, I, you know, I think uh, blockchain technology has got a way to go before it's a sort of robust decentralized cloud. But I, I think it'll happen in the n near future. I don't think it's that far out. But yeah, it'll come. But not probably. It, it, it won't take nearly as long to arrive as many people think it will. I think the state of uh, software security is terrible right now, to the point where, you know, Internet of Things is frankly unimaginable in the sense that you would end up in a scenario where millions of fridges around North America are DDoS attacking your server because they haven't been patched. I mean, we just, we just don't have the ability to write it good software. Like fun, yeah, yeah I, I, and you know, and equally, I mean, a lot of these other things with finance, I don't, we actually have the ability to have immutable ledgers that mean financially relevant things on a wide scale because there's so much fraud going on that we would reject that in favor of the current systems where we can reverse transactions. You know, when things go wrong, we can reverse and we can reverse indefinitely. And I think it's gonna take a long time before we get the computer security to the point where we actually feel comfortable with that. Can I just add something to that? Uh, there's an important point there. So um, one of the advantages of decentralized cloud technologies is that all of the computation is costed. You have to pay for it. So when you make a Bitcoin transaction, you have to pay for the Bitcoin transaction. When you make an Ethereum transaction, you have to pay for the Ethereum transaction. So that greatly reduces the vulnerability to DDoS. So you might have a device that goes crazy on the Internet of Things, but it's going to have to spend a lot of money to keep on sending these transactions to the decentralized cloud. So that's an important distinction between you know, a traditional decentralized system and a, and a decentralized system. I mean, I'll concur with the general thought that user-side security is definitely a problem. I mean, that said, user-side security has been a problem with the internet for you know 20 years now. And I think one of the interesting things about blockchains is just the extent to, like the general sort of internet of value vision I think that some people have with regards to blockchain technology is this idea that, you know, there are, 
things that, you know, the, gen the general category of things that are information and are valuable is much bigger than the set of things that we would traditionally consider to be, you know, say financial instruments. Like you also have domain names, adverti advertising space, uh, you know, accounts, uh, different kinds of information, virtual property, property and video games. And there's so many, there, you know, there's so many different classes of it right now. Each one of them potentially have their own accounts. Potentially all of them are backed by some particular email account, you know, which, ha which has the right to reset the password and that account is controlled by Google. And so I think with the blockchains, like the idea is that you could potentially have one private key that you can use to access everything and sort of really properly kind of abstract away the identity level from the application level. And then at the identity level, hopefully, you know, you could use smart contracts to sort of create whatever kinds of security policies you want, whether it's one private key, whether it's three out of five private keys, whether it's one out of seven private keys for one action, four out of seven private keys for other kinds of actions. And, you know, once you have the problem sort of that neatly encapsulated, I think we're definitely going to see a substantial amount of innovation in sort of security specific access, or like sort of general purpose blockchain access control technology. And I'm excited to see where that deal is going to lead. You want to add something to that, Vlad? Yeah, sure. I just want to say that I agree um, with Vitalik and with Peter, and I think that actually we can use blockchains to uh, make endpoints more secure by uh, doing things like um, certificate revocation and public key infrastructure to make it much more sure that the communications you're having are with a tr the party you're intending to have and not with some hacker who's compromised them. Shall we ask question to the audience? Yes, or? yes I think we come, we've got a, a lot of uh, hands up here. Uh, what we're going to do now is open the floor because we have the brain trust both on the floor and in the room. And Constance is going to man this side with this mic, if I may. And I'm going to manage the mic on this side, starting with the gentleman at the back. Um. My name is Joseph Wang, and I am probably, and I will claim uh, until somebody contradicts me that I wrote the first smart contract that's used in the business transaction. So to get to the issue of applications, there are applications right now that are screaming to be used for blockchain technology. One is, for example, 24-7 stock trading. Right now, you cannot trade stock at 3 o'clock in the morning, and the reason you can't uh, trade stock at 3 o'clock in the morning is because right now all the systems require uh, of all the markets in the world require you to to um, shut down the market and, and pass information back and forth. The only asset uh, that I that's traded 24-7 throughout the world right now in a single market is Bitcoin and that's because we've got blockchain technology. So if we want to go to 24-7 trading of everything, we need blockchain. Second thing, GPU markets. Right now, I've got a cell phone. If I want to buy, a, 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 if I, uh, this cell phone gets old, uh, I have to buy a new cell phone with a new CPU. What w you can use blockchain for is to, to offload all the CPU stuff onto the cloud, and that way, uh, I, I rent my uh, CP, I rent my GPU. If I want more GPU, I want more compute cycles. I just, um, I just pay some extra uh, Bitcoin. Third thing, flexible loans. Right now, you go to a bank. Uh, y you've got a 15-year-old mortgage, you say to the bank, well, I, I want a condition that if I lose my job, then I don't have to pay the mortgage for about uh, uh, two or three years. Right now, banks can't handle that. And uh, the reason why I went to smart contracts is that banks can't lend to small business here in Hong Kong. So uh, I just wanted to bring this up because there are applications right now that must be uh, put in, and this is why this technology is important. I would make the point uh, in the case of uh, your first example there that as far as I can tell, I can use my Visa card 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the back end of that's not blockchain. You know, it's not the lack of blockchain tech that's really preventing well, this. Uh, no, I think no, it's a lack it of a lot of other no, things. No, it, it's an illusion because what happens when you do the Visa right is that the Visa company issues an IOU to the merchant. And, and this is actually what happens with stocks is that when you trade a stock right now, nothing gets transferred. It's an IOU. The problem w with that okay, is... Okay, let's see what, what our experts are having to say to that. I think um, we can agree there's the actual business, there's clearing, there's settlement. This is definitely an interesting question, I think, to explore more because 
it's definitely not true that Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies are the only kind of assets to, to be traded even in a financial context 24-7. Like I'm sure there's plenty of you know, video game virtual currencies that get traded 24-7. There's plenty, you know, you can buy and sell domain names 24-7 and many other kinds of online assets. So my hunch is that the reason why that doesn't exist for stocks yet is more institutional than technical. Okay, but the, I mean, there's uh, the clearing time. Uh, we just uh, see. Well, clearing time. I mean, clearing time for uh, some of these virtual currency exchanges is probably a like under a minute as well. Exactly. So um, I don't. We're not here really in a fintech panel, but um, this is the promise. And Dominique, maybe you want to say something uh, how settlement can be abbreviated. Sure. So um, I, I'm sort of actually I'm kind of linked to the banking efforts to create settlement and clearing systems, but. Uh, my uh, the startup I'm a, I'm a co-founder of called String is addressing uh, the 24-7 stock trading uh, challenge by creating uh, synthetic uh, mirror assets, if you like, uh, which represent things like Facebook stock or gold, and those will be tradable on a secondary exchange 24-7. Um, and there will be some limited liquidity outside of normal market hours, but once these synthetic assets have been created, they can be traded ad infinitum around the clock. So, so, so a lot of the stuff's being worked on. I, I also know that there are other companies out there looking at some of the consumer derivatives opportunities, such as you know P2P lending, kind of swaps, um, gas price hedging for com commuters, and things like that. Uh, I'm sorry. Question. Uh, I've been told to ask. I've been told to ask a question. So. Uh, now, so two quickies. One is, um, you said that uh, blockchain is 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 great, but without Bitcoin, it is neutered. A and yet, what we know about Bitcoin is number one, the FBI, central banks, law enforcement agencies hate it and want it to go away, uh, and will do just about everything in their power to get rid of it. And number two, how on earth can 175 million dollars of Mt. Gox still be missing? if blockchain is so reliable. Yeah. I just uh, clarify what I said. I said, if you try to take the concept of, however you call it, cryptocurrency, virtual currency, digital assets out of smart contracts, you neuter it, the power of smart contracts. You still can do a lot of things. But the actual power of smart contracts and an automatic market and economy, that's what you are doing away with. And most of all, it's just people try to rename it and create even more confusion where there's already enough confusion out there by trying to make a difference between cryptocurrency and digital assets. That was my point. Um, for the one and two parts, I would like to hear Peter's opinion. Well, you know, in terms of the idea of how can, uh, how can this go missing if it's so reliable, you know, the way I go describe it is really, well, what kind of reliability were we expecting? You know, as an example, I mean, consider gold, for instance in terms of can gold be counterfeited, is extremely reliable. You know, it is gold. I can do a test. I know it's gold. And it's the basic laws of physics that prevent me from counterfeiting gold. Yet at the same time, if I go give gold to a trusted third party and they steal it, I mean, it's still stolen. There's nothing I can do that changes that type of reliability if the implementation of the first type of reliability is a piece of metal. You know, similarly with Bitcoin, the underlying blockchain does not give you any guarantees about w you know, where the money goes after you give it up. It doesn't give you any guarantees to be able to go follow the trail. Um, it's, if you use it the right way, it's extremely anonymous. In the case of Bitcoin, well, you know, people gave money to Mt. Gox, and Mt. Gox stole the money, or lost the money, or who knows what happened, but you can't necessarily track it. And also, it's still there, right? <laughs> Somewhere in the blockchain. So, yeah. um, to Pavel and Dominic, maybe, what about FBI hates Bitcoin? They own Bitcoin. Why do we hate it? <laughs> they're exactly. selling the last they, they're 44,000 it. units of it next <laughs> week, so. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was saying they're actually selling their last 44,000 units of it, I think, next week. Yeah. That they confiscated from Silk Road. Yeah, so <laughs> I think starting next week, they, you know, maybe in two weeks, they're going like, to make a bunch of announcements and basically ban it. I don't know. So they confiscated money from a drug trade uh, and didn't are selling it now. Yeah. Sorry, didn't, didn't some FBI agents steal some of the Silk Road Bitcoin? Yeah. 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 
They found it too. Yeah. I, I would make the point, you know, I mean, the FBI has gone said they hate encryption. I mean, because the FBI hates something, it doesn't make it bad. I mean, <laughs> you know, their goals are not necessarily aligned with your goals. I mean, and to the extent that it means that you shouldn't be involved in Bitcoin, well, it, same way as, you know, when you go use encryption. Um, the fact that the FBI doesn't really like that, does it mean you shouldn't use it? Well, it's, you know, just a negotiation with political power, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we as a society come to, seem to have come to an agreement that overall we can't backdoor encryption because we don't know how to do it safely and we never will. And we negotiate that with the powers that be in society in general. Um, as far as crazy crypto anarchic anonymizing technologies go, it's worth noting that 60% of the funding for Tor you know, one, you know, the sort of famous online darknet project comes from the U.S. government. Do we have another question? Yeah, quick question. Dominic, you mentioned setting up synthetics to trade a variety of products. Uh, I would be interested on the opinions of the panelists on whether those synthetics should be subject to regulation by regulators in jurisdictions like Hong Kong, the United States, or the U.K. Shall I answer first? Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, my kind of view is that um, the decentralized cloud is kind of extra jurisdictional. It doesn't have a geography. And therefore, you know, it's not a productive route to, to expect every regulator in every country to develop its own regulations on the same thing that sits in the middle, right? So uh, regulation has to be pushed to the edges. And what that probably means is that um, in, in order to get access to these synthetic assets, you have to go through some kind of KYC or other provider that is subject to the regulation of the jurisdiction you're in. So if you're in America, you'll have to go through some intermediary com uh, company in America. If you're in Hong Kong, you'll have to go through some intermediary company in Hong Kong. And those companies will be subject to the regulations of the countries where they're located. I, I can't see any other way that's going to I have a question there. I mean, what I understood is that you're basically creating mirror images of actual existing assets. So the actual existing assets should be what's regulated. Uh, then or not. No, they're not. No, it's not as simple as that. So these are decentralized tokens, whose price will, with a very very high degree of certainty, follow the uh, asset they mirror, right? Um, but there's no mapping. They're not colored coins, so there's no mapping between these decentralized tokens and some stock that's held for you by some body. Right? So I would go make the point that if you claim you're regulated. I definitely want to know whether or not you actually are. And I don't want you to be able to lie about that fact. Because after all, if I'm buying into these synthetics, I want to be absolutely sure that if I think it's regulated, if I think you know, you're know, you not a fraud artist and there is a regulation environment that protects me, I want to know if that's true or not. And I want to have absolute assurance. Equally, if I'm choosing to go and trust you because you're some shady guy on some Tor site on the dark web, I can go choose to do that, and I'm okay with that, you know, being a bit of a libertarian, but I certainly should know that. I sh certainly should be in a position where I can find out that accurately. I don't want to be in a position where you claim you're regulated and you're actually not. Another question? Uh, hi, gents. It's Hugh from Anex. Um, I've got a question kind of actually uh, uh, really slightly more technical. So uh, as, an, as an engineer building low latency trading systems for decades before uh, being in the uh, blockchain space, I can say that uh, the, you know the, the trading question actually would have a higher priority. Time is money; you need to be sub millisecond. So the characteristics of the solution you're looking for is that actually prioritises speed over trustless and decentralised and everything else. So what we're talking about here is architectural patterns. Normally, an engineer says, "What problem do I have? What characteristics are the most important?" and then selects a suitable pattern based on that. Now, the blockchain can be thought of a very, as, as a very sophisticated pattern. Sure, it's technical. It also brings in uh, economic incentives. However, it's still a pattern. It's a very good tool for certain problems. Now, most engineers in the room would know of a thing called Model View Controller. It's a famous, simple but famous pattern. Everyone knows it. One of the reasons it's famous is because thought leaders went out and educated in academia and everywhere else. They, they documented how the pattern worked, what problems it's good at, and what problems it's bad at. Now, for the blockchain pattern to become very popular and ubiquitous for those jobs where it's good, 
Who is leading that? Have you seen that? Who are the leaders who are actually just teaching people what it's good for, how it works? Yeah, I would like to answer here. I mean, interesting about model view and controller, it's, it's kind of a meta pattern. It's a pattern of patterns. And of course, patterns emerged in IT only over time. After people had recognized certain patterns to reoccur, they were able to give them names, write books about it, and start to talk about it. And I think we're seeing the same development in the blockchain world. And we are also having the same kind of, well, we're having a very confusion situation there that just Bitcoin itself is also a meta pattern, so to say, it's using a couple of building blocks that are now labeled um, in confusing ways where sometimes uh, somebody is meaning also that building block and somebody else is insisting no in his definition that building block's not part of what blockchain is. So I think the discussions that we're having here and actually the workshops that um, Koala had um, over um, the last uh, workshops is uh, exactly where these kinds of communications and this kind of um, terminology is being developed. There's also, of course, in the Ethereum office in Berlin, uh, the, the wider Ethereum community, as well as uh, the, the older and, and more experienced uh, Bitcoin community. So, you know, in terms of this kind of notion of patterns um, and requirements, I usually go talk about security software in terms of what does it prevent from happening. Now, in the case of, you know, your work with trading environments, obviously, you're not that worried about preventing certain things happening to the extent that you're willing to have solutions that, for instance, aren't cryptographically signed. You know, I've seen the details how some of these very high-speed trading environments work, and essentially, if someone gets into the secured room where all this data is flowing through, they can do pretty much anything they want, and they can get away with it if they have enough sophistication, whereas in a security sort of more security engineer environment, you're saying, all right, I want to prevent this, I want to prevent this, I want to prevent this. And I'd say in general, as to you know, this idea of thought leaders, well, you know, maybe I'm a little biased here, but anyone who talks about what are we trying to prevent with the security technology, to me, automatically, you know, kind of has a, has a lot more trust, um, you know, in terms of whether I'll go listen to them. And currently, I think, you know, the Bitcoin core devs have mainly discussed this and it's probably fairly easy for them because they're not talking about very exciting things. They're talking about very simple software that does things very robustly. Hi, uh, Nick Stadham Wilson here. Um, I'd like the panel just to help me understand the concept of consensus because to me, consensus is, a, is just is very, very woolly. Um, does consensus mean 41, uh, 51, 49? Does it mean 70, 30? Um, is it important if 49% uh, is a minority, but they're all in agreement. Um, how, how does a computer system, how does, how, how does the blockchain think about consensus? Okay, it's just along this chain rule. So whoever is faster to create blocks, those is right. So with Bitcoin blockchain, it's very simple. It's the speed of uh, com computations. And uh, if we come to proof of stake, I think Vlad will answer better way, but it's about who owns more money. Who owns, who owns both. Is there a way that we could lock out? Yeah, no? kind of. And uh, if we come to consensus that is reached between like semi-trusted parties, then it what matters is uh, basically amount of signatures that is put under some decision or some transaction or some block. So with every model you have different security considerations and requirements. Yeah, so there's there's two kinds of approaches to talking about whether nodes have consensus. Uh, one of them is whether or not they share the same state for the application. So if they all have the same copy of the thing they're trying to keep consensus on, then we can say that they have consensus. Another one is this idea of common knowledge. The idea that not only do they have this shared state, but they also know that everyone else has the shared state, and they also know that everyone else knows that they have the shared state, and so, and so on. So, uh, and another important concept is this, this idea of uh, fault tolerance. Given, you know, to, to how, many, how many faulty nodes, how much misbehavior uh, can we have before we lose this guarantee that everyone knows they have consensus? or this guarantee that everyone has the same copy of the state. 
I, I'd go point out that I think some of these explanations may come off as a little less clear than the actual situation is, which is that, you know, first and foremost, the rules of the system, as in what is a valid transaction, you know, what moves money from point A to point B, those are set in stone. That's just software that everyone runs. You know, there's no question about consensus of that, except for kind of woolly social consensus ideas of, you know, how do we make the rules of the system in general? But once you agree on those meta rules, the actual process coming consensus is very simple, very deterministic. I run the software. This transaction's correct. This one's invalid. There's no question about it. The only thing you have question about is, well, did I give the idea to her first or him first? And that's something that miners or proof of stake or other systems can determine. Now, it may be very important if he thinks he got the money first and she thinks she got the money first and a week later the state of the system has changed. But, you know, that's like this part of consensus. All the other stuff, all the rules, all the procedures, that's all set in stone and there is no debate about that. Okay, so can you please put your hands together for the very first panel, blockchains and applications. <laughs> you guys have done a stunning job. Please, can I invite you down? Uh, Denny, uh, you're going to uh, stay there. And I would like to, um, and actually, Henning, you're, you're, you're still there on stage. You're actually on the next one, too. Can I invite Pamela? Can you help us lead us this panel? Um, this next panel is, thank you, uh, Internet of Things, Internet of Things, Smart Property, Metered Applications, P2P, and DTD Transactions, Automation, and Automatons. So with that, um, can I, uh, Alan, if you can come up, Henning, you're already one, and Peter. Just get set up here. We'll begin as soon as everyone's on stage. Yep, this is uh, IoT. <laughs> Internet of Things. Okay, Pamela, please take us away. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Pamela Morgan. I am the CEO of Third Key Solutions. I'm also an attorney, and I've been participating in the Koala Project for quite some time now uh, on behalf of everyone. And I, I just like to reiterate how pleased we are to be here and sharing these ideas with you. Um, as a community, we've grown, and, and we're, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, I focus on security and governance. Um, my company implements uh, multi-signature solutions for uh, governance issues, and then we also work on uh, constructing recovery plans. So we actually work on, on the ground implementing um, Bitcoin and multi-signature features. Uh, so I am absolutely thrilled to be here and talking with these guys about Internet of Things because uh, I think that this is absolutely relevant. And you know, we've started the discussion today with, with the keynote, and then we've moved to a more uh, techno uh, technological discussion. And now we're going to move towards a more uh, philosophical discussion. And so. I'd like for each of you to take a minute and introduce yourselves, talk about the projects that you're interested in and, and why you care about IoT. I guess I'll start. Uh, my name is Juan Benet. I am the inventor of IPFS and Filecoin, two uh, protocols. Uh, we are making the distributed permanent web. Uh, and these are two different protocols that stack on each other. IPFS is a different distribution uh, protocol for hypermedia, so think of it like a new HTTP uh, that changes how we move around websites, web applications, and other systems in general. Uh, this is tuned for a world that is peer-to-peer, -peer, that is distributed, and we do away with the client-server model and replace it with a fabric uh, that can uh, move websites and web applications without origin. So you can create a payload that represents an application, sign it, even encrypt it and ship it as just one hash and other applications and systems can download that content, run the application locally, create new data and add it to the, to the file system. Uh, so this is a very new way of doing the web. Uh, the web today doesn't work that way at all. Uh, you have this client server uh, problem where most websites and web applications are constrained to only work across the backbone, uh, you know, talking from clients all the way to the backbone. This enables the web uh, to move out of that uh, and enable it in IoT, for example, like you, you can actually ship web applications built with today's web tech 
directly into IoT applications, into IoT devices, uh, and have it all work. Uh, so yeah. Uh, I stumbled into IoT completely backwards. I mean, I really um, uh, hadn't planned it. We, uh, I was working with a friend in a, a mobile payment company and he introduced me to Bitcoin. I was completely fascinated with the ways that Bitcoin can be scripted and Ethereum was kind of the automatic next step there. Then working at IBM, I um, heard about the IoT project that they were doing uh, based on the democracy, device democracy paper that was very revolutionized. Uh, I mean, just coming from IBM, that was very remarkable. So I started to become part of that um, effort within IBM, that which was basically a research effort that was using Ethereum to demonstrate how a washer can go out and buy its own detergent when it uh, realizes it run it's running out. And then getting more interested, it can even go out and um, claim that a service mechanic has to come when a sensor realizes it's necessary and prove that it still has warranty because that's also stored on the blockchain. And then from there it gets even more exciting where you can have a DAO, or um, I like this example that we we should start thinking about self-driving cars that also own themselves and have a, have a budget and are basically robots that are uh, freelance uh, uh, enterprises. So, um, and, and that's, I guess, is my, that's my fascination where you have this intersection of this new way to program stuff that is tied into real value that can really do business and then has, um, yeah, what, what we don't even call robots anymore, but uh, would be something that looks different than the science fiction robots, but is actually pretty close to um, science fiction and, and, and house like uh, the fully uh, the full automation and the, the IT that goes into building a high rise. Meanwhile, of this style here, it, it's it's just mind boggling. Nobody imagined that uh, some decades ago, I guess. And so that's that's where my fascination and my my professional um, um, uh, time with uh, IoT comes from. So uh, I'm Peter Acero. Uh, my background is in philosophy and computer science, artificial intelligence. I uh, did a lot of work in early cybernetics and brain models and things like that. And I started to get interested more in embodied forms of intelligence and robotics, social and emotional robotics. Uh, and for the past few years, I've been looking at social and ethical implications of robotics and other kinds of autonomous systems. Uh, a lot of my time has been focused on fully autonomous weapons and trying to get a treaty at the United Nations to prohibit killer robots. Uh, so I've been, I have an NGO, the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, and we're part of the campaign to stop killer robots, uh, which is with nine other NGOs, uh, the leadership of that campaign, and 50 NGOs from 24 countries. And we've been working at the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons at the UN. I also work on some civil society issues around cyber warfare. Um, and a lot of other different aspects of the social implications of robotics. So uh, right now I'm at Princeton's Center for IT Policy, and I just got a grant from Elon Musk to work on liability in uh, increasingly autonomous systems. So as we move to this Internet of Things, who's responsible for uh, the damage that is caused by some of these, you know, semi-autonomous or autonomous systems as they go out into the world. How do we compensate those who are harmed by those kinds of systems? Uh, and that sort of aspect of the Internet of Things, as well as some privacy issues. So as these things collect lots of data, share lots of data, what happens to privacy in public space uh, when this kind of data can be collected, archived, data mined, shared, who owns it, what's, what are your rights to privacy in these new contexts? <coughs> My name is Alan Shapiro. I'm a professor of industrial design. Uh, I also work in philosophy and computer science. Uh, I'm a philosopher, but I think philosophy is obsolete because it's a monodiscipline, so there's a paradox there. Internet of Things, I can't say much about it from a financial or legal point of view, I would say something about it on two levels, one on the level of code and the other on the sociological, cultural level of what it will mean for our lives and smart cities. My reflection on the relation between philosophy and computer science 
led me to my own coding project, which is I do not I accept uh, many of the basic assumptions that Alan Turing made in 1936 when he invented what we consider to be programming languages, the zeros and the ones, the logic of the discrete, the assumption that a line of code is non-ambivalent and it's a statement of formal logic. Uh, I going back and questioning many of these assumptions, taking ideas from quantum physics, the assumption that it's cool to directly read and write data from the database, that's exactly what quantum physics says is gonna corrupt the data when, when we get towards more systemic, holistic uh, kinds of data. Sociologically, your keynote speech was very poetic and very beautiful. Uh, however, you used several times words like things and machines. My problem is uh, I, am, I, I want to change the subject, human subject-centered perspective of code and also of society. Uh, I liked when you mentioned self-driving, self-owning cars. Uh, I would like to give technological entities more recognition, I as in science fiction. I would say if we look at Solaris of Stanislaw Lem, which has been twice made into a film, the surprise there is that on this planet, the ocean has a kind of consciousness. So much of science fiction is about the discovery that non-human entities uh, have, I, very careful to use the word consciousness, I would say recognition. The paradox there, of course, is they are objects, so I don't want to give them human subjectivity. I want to give them autonomous kind of android recognition of their own, and then we can learn from them. Uh, I, th I think it's important, so it speaks of internet of objects rather than things, but then that you have to move the word object to a slightly more philosophical meaning, but that's already happened in our world since we have physical objects and software objects. I believe that software should not be written by programmers, it should be written by the software objects themselves. We have to completely reverse the relationship. Uh, so I think we, for me, the Internet of Things is uh, yet another opportunity to take the side of objects, to get away from a human-centered perspective, and also to get away from the physical reality-centered perspective. Uh, if we look back over the last 20 or 30 years, we've moved into virtual reality, online reality, People uh, are, let's say, students who I teach very disoriented about that because no one has given them any set of ideas in thinking about a hybrid world. I imagine Internet of Things will lead to, say, here we are in this physical reality, but at the same time, we're in a computer game, and I could decide I want another uh, character sitting here who would be like, an animated or comic book character. I mean, we've been through, uh, and now we have augmented reality, which is great because this is now hybrid, real, and virtual. Uh, so that's my interest in Internet of Things, not too much liking the word things, not liking the word machines at all anymore since that's the 17th century. Another problem with uh, basic Alan Turing uh, compliant computer science is the relation between the whole and the parts. It's like a car engine. It's combinatorial. Uh, it should be relations of similarity or of resemblance and, and, and dissonance between the whole and the parts. It should be a holistic relation as in fractals or holograms and uh, it's been theorized in some books on holistic biology. So the, uh, yeah, I would like to just 
really bring the humanities into informatics and then rethink the whole thing. Thank you. Um, I playing along that line, uh, I think that it's really important that we look at uh, social and, and ethical implications. And so I'm going to direct this question to Peter. You know, uh, you mentioned that in your opening talk, and I'd, I'd like to hear more about where you think that we should focus. And when we look at societal and, and, and ethical implications, where, where should we be focusing? Those are broad subjects. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, on the, on the one hand, there's these sort of larger questions of the, the Bitcoin currency and the sort of regulation and the social implications and economic implications on the large scale. Um, but I think in the context of the Internet of Things, um, we can think about, I guess, what appeals to me about this whole notion of the blockchain when you kind of boil it down is that it's a distributed database system that sort of allows it self to compute itself so you don't need the centralized computation uh, and it can be tied to a currency but it's not necessary and the, the kinds of currency it can be tied to are artificial so you don't necessarily have to have an exchange to a real currency and what that lets you do is create artificial economies and so now you can apply all the metaphorical thinking about economies to these artificial economies uh, and you can do lots of interesting things with that. So then you can do bad things with that. So here's the bad stuff. I'll start with the bad stuff, and then I'll tell you the good stuff. Bad stuff is like, okay, your coffee machine is like tied in the Internet of Things, and it's going to start charging you for your coffee in the morning based on the price of coffee today and how tired you are and how badly you need to get up to work, and you're going to get surge pricing on this, or maybe your washing machine knows you're almost out of underwear, and it's going to surge price your underwear. And like you really don't want that, right? Um, that's a terrible world to live in. And then you have the, s the drone example or the self-driving car example, which I think is really useful of negotiation, right? So it's hard to think of a really good protocol for negotiation in the abstract, but we negotiate economic contracts all the time, and we can allow those sort of methods of economies and markets to drive negotiation. So if we need to negotiate uh, lane change and letting somebody into a lane between self-driving cars, that would be a way to do that, that we can sort of exploit the sort of natural property of an economic system to achieve a practical goal. Again, the bad thing would be to actually tie that to a real currency, to where people can hog the lane until you pay them enough to get out of the way, right? And so you, you wind up with all this rent-seeking behavior and people who are trying to exploit each other through all these inefficient, creating inefficiencies artificially, basically. So the positive side is, well, where can you create efficiencies? And I think this is kind of really interesting, and probably a few miles north of here is where it's really going to find its main application. So if you want to make an efficient factory, right now you have a lot of overhead and accounting and administration. So for the, you know, for the 1920s to the 1980s, we had all sorts of operations research. How do we optimize the efficient production of manufacturing systems? Starting in the 1980s, we started thinking about, oh, just-in-time production, flexible manufacturing. How can we reduce inventory, increase the flexibility of our production to supply chain changes and things like that? And that gave us like an order of magnitude, a greater level of efficiency making over previous kinds of operations research. Now we start thinking, hey, we can actually tie the accounting of the efficiency of a particular system to that system. So every robot becomes a consumer or a, a economic agent in the factory system, which isn't necessarily tied to other systems, but this is now a system that automatically calculates its own efficiency. So you can keep track of it based on, well, there's these robots are producing more than those robots. As we lose robots some for maintenance, we don't have to uh, readjust our model or change our data uh, analysis models or anything like that. It's all built into the system. And so we, we get, uh, as a sort of side effect of the creation of these systems, whole new ways of optimizing efficiency in this manufacturing systems, for instance. But that could be applied to all kinds of different systems. Anyone else have anything to add? I think that as we go into understanding how to bound the behavior of these 
what are going to be pretty much autonomous agents uh, that are not actually intelligent, right? Like what we're gonna have is not strong AI that is capable of reasoning. We're gonna have a very, very dumb set of optimizers. And this is actually one of the riskiest things to have. This is the paperclip machine. So like if you're familiar at all with AI theory, uh, kind of like the more recent uh, castings of how we get to strong AI and what problems there are, one important avenue of this research is into non-strong AI agents, agents that are merely optimizing some function. And the moment that you have a storage fabric uh, across the web, which is kind of like what we're, we're building, and the moment that you have a computing fabric across the internet, which is what uh, uh, Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin and so on are, are building to some extent, um, and the moment that you have a way to give them resources and access to any resource, meaning they have some currency and they can get more currency and so on. The moment you write a function that is capable of uh, economically doing something valuable enough for the rest of the network or clever enough for in respect to the rest of the network to start accumulating money and is able to pay for its own computing and is able to pay for, for its own um, bandwidth and so on, you have a thing that can pretty much un grow unboundedly. Uh, at first, these optimizers aren't gonna really do much. They're just gonna accumulate wealth for some set of parties. But the tricky question comes in when, what happens when a, a driverless car that owns itself has to decide whether or not it should ram into the other car and bring down the supply of driverless cars so that it makes more money? Uh, these things are going to be very real. Uh, because unless we play some strong bounds on this technology. Uh, I, I, we're, yeah. we're gonna deal with, uh, <laughs> right. see it's, it's autonomous agent already. Uh, uh, so, so it's, right now I think like a, a important amount of work needs to be done in trying to understand how these optimizers will behave uh, and how might we place some amount of simple reasoning about trade-offs. Uh, I.e., how can you make ethics mathematical in a way that we can embed into the programming. Uh, this is something that almost nobody in, in any kind of distributed uh, computing research or almost nobody in like the blockchain cryptocurrency world is thinking at all about. We're just kind of making cool stuff and making more of it and making optimizers. And this is like, it may be important to take a step back and think about these agents and what they're gonna do uh, and think about clearly how to write these libraries and so on so that somebody doesn't accidentally cause a total disaster. <laughs> I okay. I don't agree with what you said that we're, these are going to be autonomous agents that are not intelligent. Um, although you did modify a little bit uh, uh, your statement, not strong, as you went strong on, AI. Went on. Not strong AI. But I think that uh, this th to take the example of the self-driving car, it's a platform. It will be a platform, and as soon as you have a new exciting platform. You have a whole world of people, of, of programmers and developers and entrepreneurs adding <coughs> onto it. And, and uh, just as with the smartphone as a platform, you have a, a world of apps, of, o of all kinds of exciting uh, stuff that, com that comes onto it. When you have se self-driving cars, one of the main benefits is reduced accidents because the human error is gone, but then it might become very boring and dull because you take a lot of the thrill out of driving. So then people will, will uh, write using the API of that platform, they will write uh, <coughs> further enhancements to what the, s the self-driving car can do. And it will also be a virtual reality entertainment game platform. So I, th and I think analogously we could say about uh, uh, distributed ledgers like the blockchain, I, mean I think it's a, it's a platform uh, and now we're just, you know, at the early stages of uh, negotiating, competing what that platform is gonna be, but the real excitement is all the, the, the applications of it, I think. So I, I don't see, 
uh, why it needs to be restricted or we should focus on a, on a dystopian uh, fear of intelligent agents get getting out of hand. One, I think uh, it's one, one aspect I would like to, to add is that um, the blockchain is going to be a vehicle to allow um, devices to police each other because a device is basically kicked out of the consensus and the other devices will not deal with it anymore or even shut it off of any kind of market um, when it is a rude device and doesn't follow certain rules. And of course, we will have more interesting rules in the future that are part of the consensus mechanism. The concern is that gap. The concern is, the concern is the gap between creating the simple optimizers of today, like the poker bot that's gonna like make more money or the like, the self-driving car that will pick up fares um, and so on. And the gap between that and creating a, a true machine consensus that is able to understand ethics and be like, analyze what the system is doing uh, in, in a self-referential way. I think like that is a, a level of intelligence that is not what we are currently building. That is, we will end up building something like that. Um, but what we're currently building is just like basic agents with some basic algorithmic capabilities. Um, some of the more interesting things that will We'll start, uh, so, so you mentioned uh, self-modifying code, and that's one of the things that I, I'm really excited about. The moment you have self-modifying code, what can happen? Uh, turns out like pretty dangerous stuff, right? Like it, this is interesting, but should be, it's, it's like fire. You have to play with it carefully. Uh, so a friend of mine made a bot called uh, Bot Will Accept Anything, and this was a riff on another uh, program before which somebody made a GitHub repository, and he said, I'll merge any pull request you give me. And so kind of saw where it went. So anybody can contribute code, and he would just add it in. Some code broke the build. Some, bro uh, some code will just um, add more stuff and fix it and so on. So my friend said, great, let's just make a bot that does this and just pulls people. And so there's this repository right now on GitHub where you go to, and if you submit any pull request with code, it will run a poll. And it has a threshold of votes. And the number of that many votes vote yes, it will merge code. This could do anything, right? Like you could go and take, um, probably shouldn't tell you to do it. You could take Stuxnet and like add it in and then this thing will be replicated everywhere very quickly. Uh, you could give it the ability to make Bitcoin transactions and it will now have the capacity of buying things. Uh, it, this kind of stuff is like an interesting experiment that could easily like cause quite a bit of damage accidentally, right? And so like, Yes, we can find a way to make all of this stuff better. And of course, we, if we uh, think hard about it, we will. And we'll make machines that can have like this uh, more intelligent uh, behavior. However, the gap between now and there uh, needs to be treaded carefully. And what we should be thinking about right now is as we deploy these agents into these systems, what kind of ethical rules must we uh, include? Uh, my point is not that this is impossible, rather that we're not actually doing it like when you look at the, uh, the people that are actually building this stuff, uh, I'm one of them, uh, <laughs> we're not actually using these libraries of like, oh, think, I think reasonably, uh, w will my agent care about other agents? No, actually, this agent just wants to make more currency for itself, right? And so like, that's an important thing that we should be thinking about before we deploy massive uh, computational systems that allow any optimizer to do anything. But I mean, it's not quite true that there's no discussion about it. I mean, we are joking about that Ethereum is Skynet. Like that's the improvement of Ethereum over Bitcoin. It's Turing complete. It can't be stopped you know, in our fantasies at least. And uh, I think that's the qualitative difference there that if you deploy a application to um, the blockchain, then you basically give up control. While in the past you always could shut down the computer at least. You know, so so the, the quality of the mischief that you can do, I mean, <coughs> spreading Stuxnet or whatever you want. You could do that before and you could do that without blockchain or uh, you don't have to have Ethereum for it, but um, I agree the thinking of what the consequences could be of even benign projects that are not assassination contracts or whatever, wh which I don't know if they exist or not, are just a myth, but are something that we're talking about. But the gap between these extreme examples and, and the stuff that could actually happen as a side effect from benign um, projects, um, th that's something that's not been tested. It's, a, it's incredible how much uh, damage I can do by clicking the submit button on my computer screen. 
you know, I could click OK and, and spend uh, 10,000 US dollars out of my bank account, which is in most cases irrevocable, just because I would maybe even brush into the mouse in a slightly wrong way and it would click. Or I could write an email and destroy a friendship by, uh, with a few uh, poorly chosen words that I forgot to, that I expressed in anger and then forgot to remove from the email. And if I make the mistake of clicking OK before I do that edit, I could destroy the friendship. But so we've created a world already online where we are surrounded, uh, fraught, with with dangers of, of destructive action. So I think that's already, I mean, of course you're right, absolutely right, ethics extremely important, fear and worry extremely important, but I would say let's think about how fucking uh, destructive the world we're already li living in is, right? And instead of, uh, projecting uh, apocalyptic fantasies into a future which may be just psychological projections of the huge mess that we are already in. But what you're describing as so destructive is basically a testament to the power that it has. And of course you can use it destructively, but you exactly. seem to wish to have yes. the one without the other. Yeah, I think yeah, that's... No, I, yeah. I think it's... it's um, I think it's it's our responsibility to use the, you know to use these uh, technologies carefully. I agree. It is very very powerful. Yeah, I think they're very powerful, and I'm all for building ethics. And I'm I'm a little more s skeptical about how you build that in with blockchains as a particular technology. Um, <laughs> there's other ways to do it that again don't require blockchain. Um, but I think also there's, I think, something about this idea of sort of financializing all kinds of other transactions, right? That is sort of a broader social phenomenon that is enabled through this technology, right? So maybe we don't want all of our interactions and negotiations to be financialized. And that in itself is sort of a bad way of approaching the world and affects human relationships in other ways. And we should discuss that and think about how we can uh, negotiate those in different ways. Um, but I think there's also a function, as that increasingly happens, the volatility of change is also, m I think, much more dramatic. And I think that's a kind of economic phenomenon. And uh, whether these blockchain sort of systems are able to actually stabilize over time, or are they going to increasing create increasing volatility over time as more and more sort of transactions. So it's great to have 24-hour stock market exchanges or whatever, sure, but, uh, you know, and having three microsecond uh, contract settlement, but is that going to actually increase financial stability or is that going to increase financial volatility over time? I'm going to move to a, a, a bit more practical uh, question here. Um, when we look at, at these at these systems that are you know op using optimizing, um, I can't help but think about data collection and, and privacy issues and how overall these how are these data how are these uh, agents you know are how are they collecting data who owns it how how are we storing it how is it accessed what's happening in the development world today and and, and what should we be looking at. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the state of affairs that we have now is that um, our mobile phones are basically owned by the manufacturers of the individual brands. And we've gotten used to it, uh, more used than I thought it would happen. But um, I think it, this is going to be a strong roadblock in, in the future of the Internet of Things because people will not tolerate their toaster spying on them or... Um, advertisement burned in their toast um, just to have a free toaster or whatever. It's not going to be a business model. And also, the more data that is being collected by endpoints, the less value will it have because you can only target so much advertising from it. And when all Internet of Things things just use it as a business model to collect data, then 
the data's value is going to go down. However, I mean, the, the beauty of this adapt concept of the democracy of things was the approach to try to assign the ownership of the devices to the actual owners, or even the devices themselves, and uh, have a government through that that uh, cuts out this central um, governing uh, authorities or company, and instead has the blockchain as the medium where you could have devices that are negotiating out of their own agency with each other, instead of being centrally controlled. And this was the case I tried to make in the keynote, that this has a lot of overhead, and on the other hand, it's exactly where blockchain makes so much sense for IoT. I would, I would just sort of uh, somewhat disagree and, and to that extent that, uh, so I guess the current sort of surveillance of personal information through smartphones is very powerful because you carry it around, you can put so much kind of personal information in there, and you're giving a pretty exclusive access to the, the app people that you've agreed to let have access to it, or the cell phone manufacturer, or your uh, telecom provider. Um, but once you move into this internet of things, you're, uh, you're actually giving them all kinds of additional information about how you conduct practices in your house and private spaces and interpersonal relationships that goes beyond just your geographic location and, and your search behaviors and your network of telephone number friends and things like that. So there's a whole set of new information there. But there's also a whole new set of ways to influence your behavior. So showing you an ad is one way of influencing your behavior. But if you have a self-driving car and the car knows now from your personal information that you have a weakness for donuts, it's going to drive you by the Dunkin' Donuts at every t opportunity. It's going to be making route changes based on this. Or uh, also maybe making slower deliveries in order to make sure that you get hungrier before you get there so you stop for a snack. Right? And, so, and, and who has control over that information? And it's your very personal tempting to program that, <laughs> to say. And your, your, your floor cleaning robot is going to say, oh, you spilled some wine. You better use this product to clean it up. And is that because that's the best product to clean it up? Or is that a paid advertisement from the cleaning company that manufactures that product, right? And, and suddenly, you don't have access to the source of the information that these devices are providing you and how much that has been controlled and influenced by personal data that it's gathered about you and who that's been shared with and a whole host of additional problems. That's all interesting. Um, one set of, uh, another set of concerns here that we have to think about with IoT is um, the moment that you have a whole bunch of devices everywhere and this, you know, this could be from the wearables to the things in your house to things deployed out, uh, kind of connecting all sort of like parking meters and so on. We have to deal with, with I think, three main technical uh, problems. Like one of them is connectivity. How do you connect all of these pieces together. That's pretty straightforward. We know how a wireless works. Conceivably, we can solve this pretty quickly. But the second is security. Once you connect all of these pieces, how do you deal with attackers getting into them? If they can execute arbitrary code, how do you protect this? How do you do updates securely? Um, all sorts of explo exploits exist for our main computing devices. The moment that we hit IoT and we, can, we have to deal with um, attacks on personal devices across our homes or infrastructure devices mm -hmm. uh, in cities, uh, that gets hairier. And it's already pretty hairy. Uh, things are not as safe as we would like them to be. Uh, and they can get better. We just need to focus on that uh, for a while. I think security is a, is a big deal. Uh, the third is uh, a distributed consensus that is uh, regional or localized. Uh, and I think this is where uh, I depart a little bit from the traditional notion of what a blockchain is. Uh, most blockchains that we have now are these, these consensus systems that are completely global, and you have this round-based protocol that uh, you know, sort of ticks. And with every tick, everyone has to be connected, and everyone has to be um, online at the same time. When you look at the, at the real network, uh, and you think of where all of these IoT devices are going to be deployed, uh, that's not actually completely connected to the internet all the time. In fact, if you go away from kind of the developed world and developed cities, 
and you encounter uh, like rural areas or even even places in, in developed cities that uh, just are kind of not very well uh, located, you find all sorts of connectivity problems, uh, even today. I mean, uh, I just took a really long trip throughout Europe, and I was surprised to see that even in Germany, of all places, kind of between cities, uh, connectivity dropped to be pretty bad with like um, wireless devices, and the latency got so big that major websites would just not work anymore because the timeouts were just, you know, breaking. And so this, we live under the myth that says that everything is going to be connected completely uh, right now or immediately. And that's not actually perfectly true. We are on that road and we are heading towards that, but it's slower than we expected. Uh, so we have to design these systems, these consensus systems, and these exchange systems to work in the distributed case where they cannot reach each other across the network. Uh, the good news is that we, there are such uh, consensus protocols. You, you can make them and we can build them. And I think one of the most interesting areas of research uh, for consensus in general, blockchains, and these market protocols. Uh, we At Protocol Labs, that's our company, we call them like market protocols, um, is where uh, you have like this regional consensus where it's not necessarily a geographic region, but you have a sort of hierarchic, hier hierarchical uh, construction where you have uh, sets of nodes that can decide things with each other and like these consensus groups will decide things that go all the way up. So for example, if the backbone of the internet, or if we get disconnected from the backbone of the internet and I want to send you money and you're in the same room, I should be able to do that. There are ways of achieving this, uh, just not with the current way that blockchains are structured and not the way that the current systems are, are designed. Um, but that's I think one of the most interesting areas that I think we'll solve over the next year and a half. <coughs> I think that cryptography is extremely important and security, as you mentioned. I think we have the opportunity with Internet of Things to build security into the design. It's absolutely essential. We didn't do that in the 1990s uh, when we invented the Internet, that there wasn't uh, thought in the design, in the security. You can even, with Internet of Things, you can have your body hacked into one of the, I think, earliest applications is going to be in the medical area that uh, when you get like heart valves after, after medical operations, you get devices installed in your body. They're going to, in order for uh, doctors to monitor what's going on in your body, they're, they're <coughs> these objects will be uh, interfaceable and, and interface addressable. So there can be, someone can hack in to your uh, medical implants and, and kill you. Uh, on the other side, we have to, th we have to think about the uh, negative power of software in general in our world. I think since you mentioned Germany, the scandal of Volkswagen of using software to trick the American Environmental Protection Agency going into a mode of uh, low toxic emissions when the software detects that an EPA test is running. Uh, my interpretation of that is somewhat that morality, <laughs> ethics, is uh, goes goes into a gray zone, goes into a nebulous zone. The awareness of ethics is is somewhat diminished by the fascination of software. That those uh, engineers and managers at Volkswagen who thought that was okay to do, they were seduced to say, if we can do that with a neat a neat trick of uh, of software, then that's that's a pretty okay thing to do. And even losing it, well that losing that's not how those things happen, right? Uh, that's not how those things happen. That was desperation, I guess, and they reduce emission, and that's 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 maybe a German focus to reduce CO two instead of NOx. But I, I think the lesson is that we need transparency on how these algorithms work, right? And without that, we don't have these assurances. I think that's what's amazing about blockchain, right? That it allows you to get established trust, but l allowing certain things to be non-transparent and certain things to be transparent. I don't know how 
uh, to apply that to a case like Volkswagen, but if we could, that would be great. Like, I, how do I verify all of the algorithms that are embedded in all the chips in my car, in my robot, my drone, in my airplane, whatever? I, I think that's a big problem, and if this technology can apply to that, that would be incredibly useful. I mean, interestingly, uh, the Internet of Things is at this uh, interface between hardware and software. And the hardware world knows so much harder requirements when developing systems. Like they have to prove every step of the way. They have to um, verify the attributes that you built into a chip before you built the chip. And I think we will see a spillover from this kind of discipline that you see in hardware to software to go towards what you're just requ requiring. Thank you so much. Do we have time for questions? Yes, we do from the floor. So uh, do we have uh, takers? We have one at the back. Has anyone heard of the book by Pascal called The Black Box Society? No, you, should, you should read that. Uh, first question. Uh. Uh, thank you, Penda. Uh, Hugh again. My question's for Peter. Uh, a couple of interesting things coming out of this. I, I have to say I, I dislike the term Internet of Things because it assumes that software and the virtual world is not reality, and actually I disagree with that completely. It's already reality, and uh, we, already are, we already have the Internet of Things. Putting that complaint aside, um, this, this it seems clear that the Internet of Things discussion very quickly went to artificial intelligence. And in artificial intelligence, uh, I've got very dated knowledge, which is why I'd like Peter to educate us a little. Um, used to be that you used neural networks and you needed an incentive system to train your neural networks. So my, so my first question, is blockchain and Bitcoin relevant and has there been some academic uh, research into that topic? And the other one is, uh, the way that the consensus system works is top-down rules. The developers, the community, they put rules in, into the software and then everything runs with the same consensus and democracy and they reach consensus. It sounds very much like Isaac Asimov's three rules. So these are these two possible intersections, in fact, between uh, blockchain technology and artificial intelligence. And have any of those been studied or is there any merit in those thoughts, Peter? Um, I'm I'm not aware, and I'm not really up to date, I guess, on the literature at the intersection of AI and blockchain, per se. I think w w what's really hot in AI right now is deep learning. And deep learning sort of goes beyond the more traditional inductive statistical learning algorithms like neural networks to add uh, unsupervised learning stage at the beginning, so you, which is basically clustering similar things together and then doing inductive learning over that. Um, so th what this lets you do is you use large data sets. So like Google can take their whole database of Google images as they find them on the internet and then learn to recognize a cat photo based on labels because we've all thankfully labeled cat photos for them. So they have these vast data sets now. And this is where a lot of, I think, the advantages over the last decade in AI have sort of come from being able to exploit uh, big data using some of these techniques. Um, uh, but they're not, I don't think, sort of orders of magnitude of sort of leaps forward in AI quite yet. And we don't really know like what the breakthrough in AI is going to be that's going to sort of lead us to some super intelligence or human level intelligence. At the other hand, like being able to process vast amounts of data and do that kind of inductive learning has applications and power, right? That is greatly exceeds human intellectual power in certain specific ways, right? And finding useful applications of that is always going to be challenging. Um, whether you can apply some of that to these things, I mean, what, what you might have is something like applying genetic algorithm technology to figure out what good sets of rules or what sorts of, you know, establishing contracts or initiating a blockchain or something that would be more successful or provide more reliability or be more stable over time or whatever your sort of criteria are. I, I feel that, um, interestingly, the discussions about the potential dangers of the Internet of Things and optimizing algorithms creates a pressure on formalizing ethics and higher values into code that we didn't have before. Until now, it was always a great thought to have a self-aware AI or a machine that can make judgments that we recognize as value-driven. But now, all of a sudden, we are facing a future, a near future, where we will have an actual application for that. 
And I'm, I'm very curious to see um, how that will push uh, the whole uh, domain into new fields. I think we have one more question. Um, so one interesting uh, area of research is called promise theory. Uh, and this is around uh, understanding how agents might cooperate and wh what kind of rules uh, and bounds and understanding can you have between these agents before they start um, acting on each other. Uh, I think you probably won't yet find direct research uh, on how agents on the blockchain operate yet. Um, because most of the research on optimizers is just generalized. It's talking about optimizers that have access to resources. It directly applies. It's just not a uh, special case to, to blockchains. Um, another interesting uh, kind of limit that we have, which is useful for us right now, is that blockchains don't do a lot of computation, right? Uh, if you do a computation on a blockchain, we're talking about bounding that computation with the on all the nodes. Uh, the moment that we build agents which can r spin out computation off chain uh, individually, uh, and you have like a, a small piece of control on a, as e executed as a smart contract, uh, guiding a whole bunch of other computation that happens outside. So uh, we're talking about maybe running uh, neural networks outside and then taking the output of that as a decision. Uh, that's when we started getting into some interesting intersections between current AI agents, uh, or current AI learning systems uh, and blockchain uh, things. And that might be a viable area to, to do some work in. One last question. Hi, uh, a data point and then um, sort of, uh, well, a couple data points and a question. One data point, uh, in you talked about the paperclip problem. Uh, in Second Life, about 10 years ago, the, the gray goo problem actually happened, where basically um, things copied, 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 and their only way of shutting it down was to actually literally shut it down. So in that case, thank God they had a server. But it poses a risk here because if you have, you know, a paperclip or great goo problem on um, Ethereum, you might try to shut it down. But then what, right? So it's actually potentially urgent, which leads me to my second part, um, and that is. So I did a PhD in uh, AI applied to artificial creativity and uh, using genetic programming, actually, which is self-writing code. And uh, this sort of technology, it, you know, a lot of people have done stuff related to this. You could ha have these sorts of things running in Ethereum or um, sort of related to Ethereum and getting paid in, in Ether, and you could be putting those on the blockchain tomorrow. They could be creating value, being their own DAOs, et cetera. And um, as they, you know, they're going to be incentivized to get better and better at it. People could be uploading code in GitHub, et cetera. So this stuff could happen, you know, with off-the-shelf technology today, right? Um, so this is, like, in my view, very, very urgent, and therefore I think the ethics of it is, is urgent too. And my question is, um, you've talked about ethics is important. Could you speculate on what this might look like to imbue ethics into um, um, Skynet? Well, I'm, I'm going to push the, the humanist track here, which is that first and foremost, uh, it's the humans that have the morality, right? And, and we don't want to forget that too easily. Um, and there may be bad actors out there, and we need to think about how to deal with that. But I think what we want to do is figure out what, you know, what are the social goals that we're trying to achieve and then figure out, are there technical means of enforcing that at a sort of low level within a platform or within an architecture or a policy or a specific system? And then, then you're sort of thinking about the application. If, and as you get to finer grain, it's more and more specific. Um, but ultimately, we have to keep in mind that these things are still being created by people. And anything that might become sort of fully autonomous on its own is something we should be of intrinsically skeptical about and have certain kinds of safeguards in place for in general, just because we don't know what it might do. And I'll probably talk about that more in the philosophy panel. Yeah, so yeah, I, think <coughs> that I, I would say that in the end, of course, uh, people can shut off all the uh, Bitcoin or uh, the Ethereum network. So there's always that safeguard. It's not that Skynet-y, uh, what we have here now. So, and, and that kind of takes a lot of uh, catastrophic pressure from the whole scenario. At the same point, my expectation from AI is relatively low. I believe that we will, for that, also not s too soon encounter a uh, artificial intelligence that is kind of deceiving and uh, plays tricks on trying to escape persecution by 
people or whatever. Um, it's going to be algorithms. Yes, uh, optimizing algorithms uh, are also already now bots are bringing down exchanges as unintended side uh, effects of something that was originally a benign positive uh, goal of security. And um, still the means that we will have to use to attack these um, challenges are going to be very, very modest. It's just going to be writing code and it's going to be statistical and mathematical and um, using foresight and, and understanding implications, not something that actually really deals with a in alien intelligence that tries to be smarter than us. I think that in, in, in knowledge-based systems, you know, we've been thinking about this either or choice between a, a, a human or a software autonomous agent. I, I think we should try to move towards hybrid systems in which the uh, autonomous agent plays a certain role in the system. And, and has a useful place in it, and there can also be uh, a human ethical judgment in who's, in who's involved in that. So I would, I would say if I was to design the museum of the future, in the cultural area, museum of the future, library of the future, knowledge bases, uh, AI question and answer of the future, there can be both an intelligent agent component and then a, a, a human ethical agent who's involved with it as well. Uh, ethics is, is, is itself a, uh, a minefield. I mean, ethics is uh, philosophy and theology and, and, and religion and atheism. I mean, we need more education. We need more focus on ethics itself. It's an intercultural planetary question. It's not just about right or wrong, dangers of excess. We don't, we have to communicate with each other and uh, even agree on what a system of ethics is coming from uh, s so many different uh, traditions. I would just add that too, like you want to avoid designing, designing systems that allow people to avoid their responsibility, right? And duck out of it and escape liability and things like that. Okay, uh, quickly in 30 seconds, because we got to end this. Um, number one, I think the first thing to do is to keep human safeguards. So we have this with Bitcoin today. If there's a fork or something goes wrong, people roll back the chain and pick the right fork and go on. Um, as we build out these systems, we need to keep that in place. Of course, you don't want that to also be a route for economic, uh, you know, you don't want to incentivize people to like use that as an economic game, uh, but we have to have that in place. Um, two is spending more energy in uh, research along these areas to understand how we can do monitoring of these agents and what they're doing, where the money's going. Uh, the more that these things are transparent, the better. Uh, this includes like perhaps not building completely homomorphic encryption-based uh, systems. Uh, we're gonna go in that direction, and the moment that you have smart contracts executing that you cannot read at all, that's a problem. Um, three is, exercise uh, a lot of caution when adding any kind of uh, intelligent system and look at what, uh, there are these research, research uh, areas that are um, coming up with, with good sets of rules around what to put in in a program that might have access to resources and can self-replicate and all that kind of stuff. Look at those rules and, and, and think about them. And if you want to do a really cutting edge thing, then just go into researching promise theory and so on to find the real answer to the optimizer problem. There may be one, it hasn't been proved wrong. so. Good luck. Thank you. So with that, could you please put it together? I mean, perhaps uh, Memrista-powered uh, ethics bots might be one of your first <laughs> apps. Okay, could you please give this panel a, a big round of applause for a most uh, inspiring. We have uh, now a coffee break of 30 minutes, uh, ple well, until five. Uh, please come back by five. Coffee is on your left-hand side, and uh, we'll see you back just before five for the uh, the, plan, the panel in its namesake, Smart Contracts for Smart Cities.
Capture control. Calling Constance. <laughs> Come in, Constance. Right. So thank you, everyone. Please take your seats. Uh, cameramen, are we ready? You are being recorded. Thank you. I should actually say a word about that because uh, one of the reasons why we are recording all of this, again, is to scale because a lot of people can't, obviously, uh, this topic is not, uh, obviously, Hong Kong t can try and take advantage of being a first mover here. Uh, we already, in many ways, have the te telecoms infrastructure, um, but this whole s the whole topic space is global in nature, no book wide. So may I welcome Constance Choi, who will take us through smart contracts for smart cities in the next 45 minutes. Over to you, Constance. Hi, everyone. Um, so the, the theme of this conference is smart contracts for smart cities, and that is also this panel. So we've been talking a lot about this technology. Um, I think we had a really beautiful um, description this morning of what the potential might be and what these things really do. And really, I think it begs the question, you know, what, what can these technologies be used for? Because ultimately, it's a tool. And, and we get to decide what kind of values we program into that tool the tool will execute. So, um, you know, right now we're, we're undergoing a paradigm shift and, you know, speaking to creators of the early internet, like Pindar over there, um, you know, we know that this is something exciting, this is something new. Um, I think about a billion dollars uh, have already been invested so far in this space and that um, exceeds that of, of, of what was invested in the early internet. So, we're, we're going through something transformative <coughs> And, um, you know, the question is, you know, in this paradigm shift, as we um, have these decentralized networks, which change the locus and the gravity of control and coordination from centers into the edge um, that enable more people to do more things for the first time on a permissionless basis, you know, what will this in infrastructure be used for? You know, what kinds of societies will we build? So, um, so this is what we're going to try to address in, in about 30 minutes. So um, a little bit about myself. I'm a technology lawyer. I um, was lucky enough to um, have started my career when cases on the internet were being tested for the first time. So a lot of my work was in issues of first impression because the laws didn't exist. And we had to find new ways of governance, new ways of understanding um, how the policy goals of laws could be achieved in this new world. Um, and then especially as, as our lives become online, you know, what our rights and duties are um, as we create entire lives um, in, in the digital world. Um, so, um, and, then, and then actually I got into the space a few years ago, co-founded an exchange. I was the first general counsel in this ecosystem, which <laughs> was, was a lot of fun explaining these technologies for the first time to governments around the world. And so we have an amazing group of panelists here. Um, and I, I'd like for each of you guys to take a few minutes just to uh, introduce yourselves, describe what you're working on, and then we'll, we'll go right into our panel topics. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tomas Diaz. Uh, I run the Fabla Barcelona uh, in Spain, slash Catalonia. Um, and I co-founded the Smart Citizen, which is a project based on uh, building data infrastructure for the production of information from the citizens to the creation of smart cities. Um, and I think I'm here because um, I'm also running uh, the Fab City project, which uh, investigates the role of digital fabrication and the future of production of cities. And thinking about the possible future in which we stop shipping uh, containers in the world, and we ship data, they, and then that data is transformed into things that solve local needs. So there are a lot of questions of how this data is governed in the world and how we can create um, you know, smartest interactions for productive citizens. Uh, I'm Gavin Chait. I, uh, uh, develop, I'm a development economist. I uh, run a company called Whitehawk, and we specialize in open data. Um, worked all over the world on open data projects, uh, from Pakistan to Nigeria to uh, Mexico, Australia, parts of Europe. Um, and what one tends to find is that uh, as cities uh, engage in, in smart city programs, they also start to build the, the framework for open data, which is to release the information that they're collecting so that people can start to make apps or 
make informed decisions about what is happening in their own cities mm. and then to feed that uh, analysis back to cities for um, uh, response and, and ad adaptation. Um, one of the areas of, of special interest for me is, is, um, is poverty um, and economic development in, in sub-economic areas. Uh, and I regard that as a, as a data transparency problem. Um, and uh, so obviously that'll be uh, one of the topics I'll, I'll describe today. Hi, my name is Fabro, Fabro Steibel, I'm from Brazil. I work with open government. So if on the first panel they were opening the protocol, and the second panel they have internet of things, I work with people and I work institutions, I work the government, or I work journalism, I open these uh, institutions and procedures. So the thing I would be talking today, we're launching an app for people to sign petitions online. There is a rule, uh, a rule in Brazil where you can sign petitions and this will have to be appreciated by the Congress, but has been very, little, very rarely used. So we're using notarial services from blockchains to help improve the system. Yeah, hi, my name is Adam Arvidsson. I teach sociology at the University of Milano. Um, and I'm generally interested in um, social forms of the inform information economy, new business models, new economic ecologies, etc., that are emerging around digital, ec digital technologies and the sort of possible future tra trajectories that they might have. Um, I'm right now I'm researching venture capital, venture capital scenes and incubators. Um, I've also been working with Primavera on a, on a project called Peer-to-Peer -peer Value, where we're looking at forms of value creation and peer production, and we've been looking at Fab Labs, among other things, and so on. Um, and, um, and I'm becoming very interested in blockchain technologies, particularly from in relation to their economic potential. I'm really interested in the potential of blockchain technologies to open up markets and, um, um, and challenge the type of monopolies that we, that we have right now. So thanks. Um, so we've seen in, in kind of the evolution of technological change, um, you know, first you have kind of the promise of, of, of these decentralized networks. And then as we've seen with, with the internet and with data, um, a lot of uh, sometimes the result is at odds with what we thought it could do and instead leads to a further concentration of power and, um, and, and flow of capital into the centers of gravity, those centers of trust and control. And we've seen that with the internet, and now we have this kind of new internet, new internet protocols. Um, how do you, uh, you know, and, and actually in, in this space, you saw the same thing with Bitcoin, where the first story around Bitcoin was that it was horizontally empowering, um, that it would help the developing world, and, and actually, um, in, in, in fact, it's you know, led to a lot of speculation, concentration of mining power, and you know, my question is, you know, are we going to use this um, this new tool to play the same old game, or can we play a new game? You know, why why are these technologies emerging? What what kinds of of social answers or new economic um, forms are these trying to speak to? Me? Yeah, I, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> 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 well. <laughs> I mean, there's been a lot of, uh, there's usually around new technologies a lot of projections on these technologies, either utopian or dystopian, and we saw a lot of that in the, in the former panel. And um, I mean, I tend to believe that usually the social context in which technologies are used are generally stronger than the technologies themselves, right? Um, the social context in which these technologies are being used now is um, a sort of very sort of heavily concentrated, monopolized financial capitalism. So it's quite probable that to a large extent these, this, these technologies when they become implemented will replicate the logic of that system which is that of sort of uh, creating and monopolizing markets. It's there's sort of a common misconception that capitalism and markets is the same thing actually. Empirically speaking it's the absolute obvious cap opposite capitalism develops by monopolizing markets by creating so-called anti-markets in a sense. And we've seen that happen, as you said, in the social media sector, in the internet sector, etc. So I'm sure we're going to see similar things with blockchain technologies as well. That said, however, this was another part of the coin, which is that even though these technologies are inserted in existing power relations and get heavily shaped by these existing power relations, right, which is precisely what we've seen in the social media sector, it's what we're seeing now in the whole venture capital sector, where an enormous potential for innovation is being essentially channeled into 
control on the part of a very, very small network of venture capitalists and everybody is being made to produce ex essentially the same types of apps that help you to find better music when you're sipping Starbucks coffee or things that are essentially completely useless because the point of them is not so much that they are useful but that they serve as lottery tickets in the great financial lottery in a sense, right? So we've seen that and I'm sure we're going to see similar things with blockchain technologies but on the other hand, at the same time as that happens, these technologies also have some sort of effect in themselves because even though social media that we maybe we thought in 2004 would be genuinely and somehow liberating and, and democratizing have turned into um, Google and Facebook and now Uber, etc. These things also permit us to do things that we weren't able to do before, right? And I'm sure that even though we might see emerging sort of large, powerful financial actors making heavy use and even sitting on blockchain technologies, blockchain technologies will emerge, will, will let us do a lot of things that that we want we aren't able to do today, right? And, and one of the most important things, and maybe we can talk about that later, but I think is that uh, blockchain technologies have an enormous potential to sort of distribute and democratize uh, the sources of monopolistic power that are presently operating within the global economy, which are essentially financial power, the access to capital, and organizational power, the ability to organize complex processes. Yeah. Right, so th this technology, I, th I think at its heart, is you know, really exciting because it really enables a new form of coordination. You know, previously we had to rely on central bodies to coordinate at scale, and, and here we have technology where we can, co where we can co coordinate across the globe um, in a per on a permissionless basis. Now, I'm, I'm interested to hear from Tomas and also from Fabro. You guys have been involved on the ground in tying civic engagement to the democratic process in many ways, you know, before the emergence of blockchain. And so now with these technologies um, and the, the promise of these technologies to really be a, a very fundamental infrastructure um, of communication, of financial networks, where do you see kind of the opportunities for blockchains and smart contracts on those blockchains to, to, to um, allow for people to participate, for embedding into the technology um, this idea of, of the democratic process? So, so I'm used to work with uh, systems that are really closed, which are called the government. So it seems to be a representative and open system, but basically it's kind of crowdfunding. You pay the tax, they do the job. So when you ask politicians for you to have a role on it, they don't even know how to start with. Uh, you cannot enter the rooms, you cannot enter the groups, you cannot do policy together. And when you look at the social media, it would be kind of like a place for discussion or some kind of discussion, it doesn't work. People can like, dislike, disagree, agree, but when you have to do crowdsource, when you have to do something together, usually people cannot come together and do something. So basically what you have to do is that you have to find micro tasks, uh, really, really small tasks that people can go together and do something. Waze, for example, is uh, wonderful. Basically, you just leave your app, uh, your mobile on, and then you tell you where you are, and then you can know traffic. But then how do you create legislation with it? How do you improve the government? So when I think about the, the blockchain, and I think about the internet, the promise of the internet at the beginning is that it will be open for everyone, so everyone can contribute. And then we start to see more and more closed networks and closed systems that resemble how government works. So my look at blockchain is really utilitarian. I, I, uh, I would say, can I use any of the apps of blockchain to do better government? Well, the first one would be notarial services. So if I can authentify uh, identity and a vote or a support for something, there is something that can be transformative. And the second one is that you think when you give money to a political party, you're kind of giving a speech somehow. So not only you're transferring a coin, but you're also transferring the power to you represent me, do something about it. So if I can use a decentralized coin system to transfer money here and there, and with this money I can elect a representative somehow, or I can empower representatives, that could be transformative because I have on other forms of political parties, on other forms of representativeness. So that would be the two takes I take on blockchain. Yeah, I would like to link it with the previous question as well because uh, I think it's, it's, it's like a, an added layer to a process that we had been involved for the many years of existence of humanity. But 
I'm just going to go back like 500 years. W actually, today is 12th of October is in the celebration of the uh, discovery of America. I am I am Venezuelan myself. So by that by that time, um, you know, European. So the rest of the world was not connected. We didn't know that it was rounded. So there was this idea of the vision of the world it was really extended by knowing there was more land beyond the horizon, right? So it's like if today we found life on Mars, if someone just say, hey, hello, where are people here? Actually, it could be, it would happen because there is water there. But if you think about it, also in the 15th century, the, um, the printing press was, I was invented and then it basically released knowledge and then opened the Renaissance and then the industrialization and then the accumulations of production by a few hands and then they created the whole economic system in which we are today. But if you think also in the shorter term, you think uh, from the 50s or thing until now, the invention of the computers, uh, the internet, and now digital fabrication and the possibility of create a governance tools for all of that is basically a result of what we need. So when I see the opportunities of using something like the blockchain, it's actually seeing the transformation of a society that we're starting to live in the digital world. If you think about how those evil tools like Facebook or, or Twitter or, or YouTube have made to us, actually they turn us into produ producers of content. We're now producing content. We were used to consume content from the TV or from the radio or from the newspapers. But now we produce content, sometimes very in a stupid way, just posting pictures on Instagram of our dinner. But we are producing content. When you take this into the physical world, it's actually when you have the ability of change completely the rules. 3D printing is, is just the tip of the iceberg of what is coming. It's actually being able to have digital materials, program them, create things, get rid of waste, shipping data instead of, sh uh, of containers in the world. Then you need a way to rule this. And the way of rule this is not by few people. It's actually in an intelligent enough distributed system. I don't know, I don't have a clue how it, this could work. But basically, I'm here. Um, to ask these kind of questions. How we make this work? Because it's, it's becoming possible, actually. So it's an intersection of uh, an historical evolution that matches, it's bringing together all these technologies to actually produce change, I think. And you're, you're actually really seeing that on the regulatory front as well, that um, you, know, you have this model of the nation state, which is actually relatively new. And um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's posited in the, in embedded in our very constitution that it's a zero sum game between the government um, and civil society, in which civil society gives up rights in return for protection. And with these technologies, you're really seeing a very shifting paradigm where everything is very complex, and it requires this coordination. It requires a multi-stakeholder approach. The governments need to know how the technology works. Technologists need to know what what the public policy goals are. Um, and you're seeing this increased acceleration of change and then in the correspond corresponding acceleration of that governance gap. And so I'm curious to know in your workings with government in, in kind of um, introducing more civic engagement um, and um, opening up these, these closed centers, is there a recognition as you work with, you know, in, in, your, in your home countries um, of a receptiveness to collaborate together instead of seeing this as a competitive zero-sum game between rights and, and laws, um, this idea that together you can build uh, and coordinate um, better systems for people. Well, if you think about what the purpose of a smart city is in a developed economy, it's the idea of, of making local government more responsive to the needs of the citizens. So we are in a situation now where the majority of people live in cities. Um, and that imposes infrastructure requirements, the, the humanization of cities that, that, you know, they were not originally designed this way, but people now want to raise their children in cities. People want to live in cities. And how do you get information from people in such a way that, that makes government more responsive? I mean, it's simple stuff like, you know, is there enough plumbing? Is there enough electricity? Are there enough schools? Um, and then you've got all those other factors that make cities livable and interesting and fun. Um, culture and, 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 and that sort of thing. Certain cities, certain governments are starting to recognize that there needs to be this two-way data conversation. Um, it's not just about us mining our citizens for data and then imposing solutions upon them. Um, a lot of cities, particularly in Europe, 
are, are starting to experiment with this two-way conversation. Open data is definitely part of that. The idea that the books are open so that the citizens can scrutinize what government is spending money on on a line item basis and say, hey, wait a minute, you're overspending. I know I can provide that cheaper. Um, and it's, it's these kind of distribution of power back to people. I mean, it's, it's predicated though on a lot of kind of native, native infrastructure that people might even have forgotten about. You know, there's a responsive government because there's regular elections, because you can vote people out of power, because um, you have rule of law, you have courts, you have all these transparent processes. Um, and so it's, it's kind of only really happening in places where governments are already responsive. But you also have to recognize that governments that open themselves up for this, it's a terrifying experience on, on many levels. I mean, people that have sat with a spreadsheet on their computer for the last 20 years, you know, looking at traffic data, um, and have never shared it with anybody before, and now suddenly they're gonna reveal that to people, and people are gonna scrutinize and say, hey, that explains why we have a traffic jam here every day at five o'clock, it's because you're an idiot. Um, they're not exactly comfortable with that idea. Well, in, in, in our case, um, Barcelona, the, the previous government of Barcelona, which just changed in May, was really advocating for the more corporative, top-down approach to the smart city. Um, and as you know, in Barcelona, there is a celebration of a smart city world con conference every year, where it's very interesting to see the process. I think it's like this is the fifth year, but if you would go five years ago to the Smart City Expo, you would see companies selling products, basically. So there were companies selling data systems, IBM, Intel, etc. cetera. No? What is really interesting is that if you look at the last year edition and also the topic that is going to be this year, is you, you could see governments selling strategies and starting to talk about the smart citizens and citizen empowerment and so on. So it looks like a trend on the citizen empowerment side, but I don't really think that governments know how to really do it. Um, and I think this, is, this opens a lot of opportunities for, for possible applications on turning a discourse, a political discourse, into action. And, and for sure, there will be room for that. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear on that note um, from, from Fabro about some of the, the work that you've been doing in collaboration with stakeholders in Brazil to, to do exactly that, to promote citizen engagement on a real level in a way the government might not understand because of technical limitations, um, lack of time to learn about these technologies, <coughs> but, but where policy goals really are aligned. Yeah, I think uh, what I've been doing in Brazil as the Open Government Partnership and other things around the world is that we try to open government. So we try to apply the principles of transparency, which means that the data should be public except there's a reason why not. Uh, participation, which means every process should be public except a uh, reason why not, and should be accountable. So every decision of the government should be accountable for itself. And then we tried to apply this yesterday for the blockchain governance and it was a, an interesting experience. Uh, the one thing we're doing in Brazil and that it triggers us on how to do it is that we just need to do a simple test. We need to certify that someone signs a petition. Um, th the reason why we need that is that the technology used to do that in Brazil right now is a pen, a hand, and a paper. So you need two million hands, paper, pen, to sign a petition and then these petitions go to the Congress. Uh, the, four the four legislation that went to Brazil, they were amazing in terms of fighting corruption. They are landmark, the milestones. But how do you make like a, a, a large scale of that? Uh, the first thing is that you need 3% of signatures. I know 3% of the population of Brazil that I dislike. These people will kill people, uh, they will reduce rights and things like that. I don't like them. So one problem of participation, if you just open participation, as you could just apply a system, is that you might have the 3% that you don't like doing things that will just like the others. So they're really disruptive, and then in the blockchain, we saw this possibility of someone disrupting the whole chain. So what you need to do is just to certify people doing, saying, I have the rights, I'll do this. So we have one personal data, which is a voting record, that needs to be in that paper. We have your name and your date of birth, it's a personal data that needs to be there. And you need to have a signature. We need to have something that is unique from you that says, I am the one who uses that. It can be your personal password, password, but 
most likely would be your cell phone that will say it's enough to say you are you. So we put this multi-factor uh, authentication uh, method and basically it's plausible to say you sign it, but you also need to say that uh, you sign it on that specific moment. So when you have elections, you have election on board, you have a place to vote, and then everyone recognizes that if you go to that place and you place that and you press that button, you are you, that event happen. If you have an app and you have constant voting system, then you have to have an authorial services to say that you were with you. So this is why we're using blockchain to certify the system. That's, uh, I'm, it's heartening to know that these kinds of experiments are going on and governments are, are receptive to the ideas. Um, to take a little bit of a different tact, um, you know, in my, in my deep dive in the space, I've learned just the most startling things, the most fascinating things, um, things like you know, half of the world's food goes to waste, um, that 75% uh, of all the foreign aid that's sent, sent to, to Africa with all the concern around whether it's actually reaching the communities rather than going into corrupt governments, that 75% of that value is charged back in remittance from, from those migrant workers that sometimes represent half of the GDP in those countries. Um, you know, other statistics, that there's enough housing right now for everyone to have a 2,000 square foot house and, you know, and I see on, uh, as the other corollary, this increased competition for these jobs, these, these scarce, these so-called scarce jobs. So, you know, as we move from um, these, these physical components of the old world into a digital world, into the information economy, um, you know, you really see the limits of how we are measuring value <coughs> and, and, and how we're able to track the things that are actually creating value. So, you know, with blockchain, it really enables a new kind of counting. You can tokenize many, many things. You can perhaps count irrefutably, incorruptibly, things you've never been able to measure. Um, so my question really is, you know, you guys are working in very diverse sectors. Is this, you know, and, and this goes to your point, Adam, about, you know, it's human logic that's being built into these tools. Um, is this really a problem of counting? Um, do we need a new type of human consciousness that shifts from this, this idea of scarcity into this idea of abundance? Um, can we move and evolve from uh, a, a mindset in which we're competing over scarce resources, but rather where there's enough really for all of us to have new forms of value creation? Uh, no, probably not. <laughs> Don't say <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> oh, why? But we could possibly think about maybe creating the types of institutions where uh, competition for scarce resources can unfold in, in a simpler way or a better way. Well, I mean, let's, let's start from the beginning. I mean, one of the, uh, one of the big problems with the contemporary uh, capitalist economy is that um, it's not really able to generate growth anymore. Right? Uh, interest rates are historically low, lowest than they've been ever. Uh, yet uh, growth rates across the world are also historically low. So uh, it seems that the ca global capitalist economy has sort of stalled everywhere and it, doesn't it has an enormous amounts of productive resources, but it doesn't really seem to know what to do with them. Right? And this is, of course, one of the major causes for joblessness, depression, and inequality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this happens within the context of a heavily financialized economy. Now, this is nothing new because if you look at the history of the capitalist economy, which has a very long history, some origins, some time in Europe in the 14th century and then moving onwards, and has sort of passed through a number of cycles of that all look the same. They start with the cycle of material expansion. Uh, capital is going into the commodity economy. Usually this is organized around a new innovation, the automobile or industrial production or something like that. And then goes on for a while and then sort of that the, the profit rates in that new innovation are exhausted and then capital passes away, go, moves away from the commodity economy to a fi financial economy. And the financialization of the economy is usually sort of the end phase of, an I of, of, a, of a cycle of accumulation that builds on a particular innovation. Um, and now we're in that type of phase, and, and uh, one of the other characteristics of that type of phase is that there isn't really any notion of value anymore. What do I mean by that? Well, um, of course there are prices, right? Markets are setting prices. 
but there's really no way uh, to justify and rationally reconstruct those prices. Okay? Um, the logic behind pricing on financial markets today, and those are the markets that dominate the global economy, is a logic of derivative financial instruments. Okay? The logic of derivative financial instruments is a logic that is completely collapsed onto the present. Right? Derivatives have, don't evaluate productive resources in relation to some sort of future goal. Right? It evaluates the relative riskiness of different types of capital. So it has no sort of, it's a, it's an, it's a type of capitalism that doesn't have a prospect for the future anymore, right? Um, and this, this type of, of situation is to a large extent a result of the very success of capitalism. So capitalism is a victim of its own success in a sense because it's in the nature of capitalism to try to make itself, the process of capital accumulation, as independent as possible from social concerns. Right? Um, and, but of course, if you're completely independent from social concerns, um, nobody is forcing you to take other conceptions of value, such as welfare, economic growth, etc., uh, etc., et into consideration. I, I'm finishing now. Uh, but <laughs> no, I saw you were sort of moving with my. Um, but I mean, one of the things that I think, I mean, the, the absolutely necessary thing, I think, I mean, to, to face over to, to, a, to, a, to a period of, of abundance where we all love each other and exchange carrots for marijuana is probably not going to be possible. But what we could imagine maybe is to face over to a type of capitalism that is more socially rooted, that is sort of more, uh, that is forced to somehow to relate to a wider range of socially rooted notions of value, which could be, well, economic growth, wealth, ecological value, all these sorts of things. Right? Um, and that's that requires, of course, um, social for forms of social organization, social movements where people somehow make their voice heard, but it also requires a medium whereby that voice could have an actual impact on the processes of capital accumulation. Right? Um, if you think about the process of the Industrial Revolution in England in the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution in England was revolutionary to a large extent because it forced a uh, fairly stagnant mercial merchant capitalism which was heavily rooted in very small cliques of merchant capital uh, to be dependent on uh, a large labor force. Somehow at a certain point, workers and labor became necessary. Uh, and therefore, um, this capitalism started to have to sort of um, uh, respond to the demands of labor. It started to have to become a capitalism that's not just interested in the accumulation on the part of few individuals, but actually in the production of consumer goods and all these sorts of things. Right? Um, maybe today, to some extent, blockchain technologies could be some sort of medium uh, that could allow for that to happen in new and different ways. Right. I mean, there's, there's a, I mean, if, if what I've heard this, this uh, anecdote that if what every mother does in her own home, which is raise children, take care, of, take care of elderly parents, these things that aren't counted in the economy, if she were to just go next door and do that for her neighbor, the, the GDP of the country would double overnight. So there's something that's happening that's creating a more viable world um, that, that we're not able to count. I mean, the WhatsApp evaluation of 17 billion, how do you put that price on it? Um, how do we, I mean, perhaps when an article is, has widespread dissemination, impacts people in a wide way, how can we value that article over another article? So I'm, I'm curious, with blockchain, you're able to do this, you're able to count things perhaps in a different way, and perhaps you can, um, as a corollary to that, reduce waste in cities, um, you know, be able to figure out when traffic lights should go on, off, what the ideal patterns would be. Um, and, and even in the developing world, I take Ubers all around the world, and I've, I have I've t spoken to countless um, drivers from Africa. And this guy from Kenya told me, we, we live in the land of milk and honey and we're starving. So there's some mismatch between the value and the abundance and the information that perhaps smart contracts and blockchain might play a role. So I'm curious to know yeah. from, from the developing so world, also from, from your perspectives on the ground in South America. So we were discussing America. earlier yeah. and, and, and basically pointing out that uh, both Belgium and New Zealand managed to survive for quite some time without governments when uh, elections didn't quite work out. And yet the societies did not fail in any way, shape or form because the institutions of state work. And so there is continuing trust even in the absence of political leadership. Whereas a country like Somalia has had no government for 20 years. Um, 
and it has completely failed to provide for the needs of its people, and it cannot. There are no institutions which can do so. Yet at the same time, some of the world's most stable and cheapest um, uh, mobile phone access is available in Somalia. Uh, and what you basically do is you hire a local warlord and you ask him to protect your mobile phone tower. Um, and so even in the absence of a stable state, you're still seeing uh, financial, sophisticated financial systems like MPISA, uh, which is mobile money, trading in broken states. Um, and what we have in, in, in some of the world's fastest growing cities is a lack of any sort of representative or stable government even as these cities need to expand and build services for the people that live there. I mean, half the reason you're seeing um, uh, waste in, in the supply chain, food supply chain, is because there's no cold chain anywhere in Africa. Um, and so a huge amount of food is wasted between the farm and the city where people are living. Um, and where you're, you're also looking at something like four billion people who have no legal representation whatsoever. So there's not even a way for people to collaborate in the absence of a functioning state, okay? So it's, it's providing autonomous systems. Now they're emerging anyway. If you look at MPs, it, it, it was mobile phones and people started using prepaid telephone money um, as a means of currency and it developed into what is now 40% of Kenya's economy. Um, which is purely SMS between people, even at the charges that are being made, because it was better than the alternatives. So it is not that a blockchain system or cryptographic identity or anything like that is a replacement for government. But the same as in PISA, in the absence of government, something like that can build the opportunity for cooperation, for trust, and for participation in a community that allows some sort of planning for the future and hopefully that stability eventually leads to the sort of governance that allows us to have first world problems of whether the traffic light is coming on and the, at the right time. I'd, I'd love to quickly hear from the two of you on that and then we're gonna open it up to questions. We just have a few minutes left. Okay, I'll go quick. I, th I think there's one important issue that you raise it is the difference between information and knowledge. So get blockchain. So I'm a computer, I ask all the other computers to fact check something, if all of them fact check something, I produce knowledge, meaning that go forward, just send this uh, to the next one. So there's information to knowledge. So in smart contracts, uh, it's one way of producing knowledge out of information. So if my fridge has no eggs, then buy some eggs, release the funds to buy the eggs. If your hedge fund is this percent is that, then do this. So. Uh, the fact that blockchain will produce lots of information, but making the knowledge all of it, it's one jump. So um, I like the keynote speak uh, when it says that um, uh, blockchain is a way that one machine trusts the other. And the reason is that the protocol protocol is uh, has the, the, the rule for knowledge. But when, I, when we talk about waste, when we talk about sustainability and so on, the promise is that with the information, we automatically generate knowledge, but it's not usually the case. So maybe we need artificial intelligence, and then we can provide this, or maybe we can use humans. But I think blockchain, we provide lots of information, but it's still in the process of institutions and government and so on that you can provide knowledge based on the information they will provide us. I, I would like to take mm, uh, a slightly different approach, which is like uh, this thinking on machines, artificial intelligence, rolling, ruling the world, the smart cities, making more efficient time, and mobility into cities to, and, and then use the whole blockchain to that. I, I think that I might not be interested. I might be interested on how people could feel empowered and, and also could generate value out of their actions. Uh, I was saying before, we are produ producers of data which are, is used by someone else to generate wealth. Um, there's a huge challenge when you don't only produce data, but when the time comes, when you produce things, you produce a design that someone else can download and produce a big uh, startup or, or business somewhere else in the world. So there's a big gap between the, that, the knowledge coming from, from humans and how to generate value out of that knowledge. And especially now when we are seeing all this open source movement going around and creating a lot of value and a lot of the times that value is not coming back to the right people. So I see here an opportunity for actually making a value generation mechanism for human agency. Well, uh, thank you. We'd like to open it up for, for questions. Uh, 
Yeah, I like very much what Adam was saying in his uh, sociological analysis of, of uh, markets and capitalism. And what I was thinking was, we've heard it said today that the killer application of, of black blockchain-like uh, led distributed ledgers is money. So I would think one way where we could get towards a transformative possibility, as, as Constance is asking about, is to think of what money is and to, and to turn it upside down, uh, to think creatively of some alternative system of money. Uh, and one way that I think about it is maybe if some government like Hong Kong or some philanthropist like Bill Gates but with a little more sociological understanding, uh, would have an idea connected with considering the citizen of society as in credit instead of in, in debt. Because in uh, our society, basically you are born 60,000 US dollars in debt. You are constantly getting credit card and student loan debt. You're constantly worrying that you'll be hit by some char unexpected charge. Uh, it conditions to bring in, let's say, Foucault. Uh, it's conditioning you to a, s a society of control where you've got to work all your life in order to keep this fundamental indebted state of human condition under control. Uh, in Sweden, uh, wi which is your nationality, there are, in, there are many ideas of guaranteed income. That would be, in a, in a prototype, a sort of the opposite of this uh, indebted state. So is it possible to think of the blockchain as maybe implementing, in a hypermodern, sophisticated way, some system of guaranteed income in which citizens would be granted an abundance of currency and it somehow be able need to the play ar for that. around <laughs> with that. You, you definitely don't need the blockchain for that. That's a basic income grant. It comes down to whether the tax base can afford it. Yes, but the blockchain gives you a technology where it... It, I mean it of simply would allow you to distribute it at low cost. A, it's not a technological determinism. It's the social conditions which really matter. But the blockchain gives you a technology where you could uh, creatively play with uh, developing such a system? Well, I mean, I, I think there are other potentials for, for blockchain. I mean, the question of, of guaranteeing minimum wage it's, uh, or guaranteeing universal income is probably another question, as you said, has more to do with political power and other things. But um, I mean, certainly blockchain technology opens up for a number of things. I mean, one thing that it opens up for is that it opens up for the transformation of a number of life processes and social relations into assets that can operate as collateral. Right? Uh, you can capitalize on your reputation, you can, um, et cetera, right? And, and, and probably that's something that Facebook and other social media companies are now sort of aiming at doing to becoming sort of universal clearinghouses for measuring the value of your social network and your reputation, et cetera, and enabling you to use that as, as a collateral for um, credit or mortgages and other sorts of things, right? And this has this it's has trust. Uh, yeah, this has good and bad consequences, right? I mean, it means on the one hand that you introduce a financial logic into every type of social relationships, which, as someone said before, can be quite intrusive in certain points, right? But it also has the ability to. I think Herman de Soto said this about uh, informal economies, right? To transform assets into capital that can sort of be used as collateral. Another thing that I think is also very promising with blockchain technologies is that um, it enables, um, I mean, it has potentially the possibility to um, democratize the control over financial markets. Um, in the sense that uh, you can imagine, I mean, we're working with, right now with some friends of mine, we have a project with, uh, um, we call it, uh, in the new rural economy, that's a lot of mainly young uh, um, university educated people who go back to the land and start farming, uh, partly out of choice and partly because they can't find jobs. It's a lot like a global trend, but it's particularly big in, in the Mediterranean countries, southern, southern Italy, Greece, and Spain, etc. And one of their main problems, of course, is that they don't have access to capital, right? 
uh, because they're completely outside of, of capital markets and agricultural intermediaries and banks aren't interested in people who don't make money, etc. So we had um, people over from another blockchain outfit this in our summer school this year and talked about possibilities of doing sort of community-based futures contracts so that you can sell your harvest in advance and have a predictable cash flow, etc. And it's possible that you could extend that into blockchain-based things like um, savings accounts or credit cards or even mortgages, etc. Um, that would be really interesting because that would sort of open up the established financial system to very, very heavy competition from a wide range of different types of actors, right? You have like credit cards that are founded by cooperative supermarkets or by the Boy Scouts or, or by a, a gay and lesbian association or whatever you want, right? I mean, could have, um, and and that would be interesting because it, it would it would allow also for I think um, um, on the one hand a redistribution of of capital which is now I mean capital now is disproportionately concentrated on financial market and it doesn't trickle down to the point that many economists are now talking about the people's QAA QE QE right people's quantitative easing that you have to put it in and this could I mean blockchain could be something to achieve that and sort of actually distributing access to this and, um, and in distributing access also putting a lot of pressure on the existing financial system and allowing it to reform. So these are more of the types of, of sort of scenarios that I would imagine, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have just one more question Sorry if anyone has from the audience. Well, oh. Anyone? If not, we can just uh, over uh, yeah. uh, something to say. Well, I figure that you know, we were asking what's the killer app if it's not money? Um, and I think the killer app might be trust because if what you're trying to do is raise capital based on the fact that nobody knows who you are and uh, you have no asset that you can put up to, to anyone who's willing to give it to you, then the trust basis of do we trust you as a human being, um, y you already have some of these markets taking place now with education, for instance, people basically getting bursaries from other people um, on the premise that I'm going to study something useful and then I'll come and work for you afterwards. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's a sort of American problem that you're born in debt. Uh, in Europe, you're not necessarily, but you might not have the opportunity. Trust becomes really, really important in, in these sorts of exchanges and really important in a city that is supposed to be responsive to the people that live there. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists. It's really thought-provoking. And um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Please put it together. <laughs> Pre credit the next for 4,000 years. OK, so the last panel for today. Blockchains demystified. Could I invite Vlad back up on stage? <laughs> and Henning, for another heavy hitter. You got like top score today, man. Okay. Blockchains demystified. It's the last session for today. Oh, no. Because you were looking at slides here, weren't you? This is a cool little slide loading. It's not. It's not the projector. There we go. Could be. No. Uh, wait. Here we go. This is probably just for that. So I need to. Um, I guess. I guess what I'll do is make. An, I'll make two. Win I'll make two windows. Uh, maximize maximize the maximize the design. Design. Yeah, it's fine here, but the, the the issue is that um, we can't see it much here. Here we go. I want to see it both here and there. Sorry, guys. One 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 minute. Just te so some technical difficulties. It's showing there and not here, and Ubuntu is hard to make <coughs> deal with all the screen things. Probably convert to just bringing it up again. <laughs> Give me a couple years. Oh, this is actually not going to work. Let's do that. I mean, okay, while Vlad is figuring out, you figured it out. Okay, cool. So I have this idea. So um, I would like to quiz the audience. Um, 
who here has used Bitcoin? Who here has Ether? Who has uh, Ripples? Okay. Who knows what Ripple is? Who has heard of Tendiment? Awesome. Okay, cool. Who's got Dogecoins? No <laughs> way. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> but it was a scam. Fun <laughs> scam. I can't imagine. Hey, look at this one. Yeah. Great. Great. All right, cool. So we're gonna give a talk that we hope will help you understand uh, how to think about blockchain protocols and how to think and compare different blockchain protocols uh, and just get your mind around these things, uh, which we, som we sometimes all have different words to talk about it and we talk about different protocols using the same words and it's, it's not always clear what the distinctions are, you know. Uh, and hopefully uh, it sh things should be a lot clearer after, pre after this presentation. Uh, we're gonna try to keep it not too technical, but also keep it very true. So, I'm doing the metaphors. <laughs> Here we go. Demystifying the blockchain. Power, hype, reality. So we've seen, especially with Henning's opening talk, that there is like a tremendous power with blockchains um, to be like censorship resistant public agreement between computers. Um, and ha and there's, a, there's a lot of interest in the space and um, and that's led to a lot of, uh, and because the interest kind of has come before a lot of the research and a consensus in academic circles, there's been a lot of um, confusions as to the reality of blockchains. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, and work through the power, the hype, and the reality. So there's actually two things that Bitcoin invented. It invented two completely independent inventions in consensus technology. One of them are, is called blockchain-based consensus, or blockchains, and the other is called economic consensus. So economic blockchains are like this type of consensus protocol that comes to consensus via compromise rather than coordination. Instead of everyone talking to everyone to agree on the next change, someone will propose a change and then everyone will agree saying that, that that new change is better than what we've had before. Economic consensus, on the other hand, is this innovation that has allowed this consensus protocol to exist on the public open internet without a single network administrator, without a group of network administrators, without administration, period. It's the economic consensus that allows blockchains to act as a public utility. I would, I would like to add something. I, mean, uh, I came here with an understanding that everybody has his own private definition of what a blockchain is. I, was, I, was re I really freaked out yesterday when I realized that Vlad and Peter could actually agree. That gives me a whole new trajectory of my research and learning, uh, which is now I'm going to find out if Dominic might also agree with what they think. He's over there. So we're gonna go through the projects and we're gonna talk to talk about them in the, this language of blockchains versus economic consensus. And uh, we're gonna go through them one by one and see, what, see if we can just say what they are. But firstly, let's talk about consensus. So consensus protocols, as we talked about a couple times today and which we need to iterate over and over again because it cannot be clear enough uh, they're used to make one reliable computer simulated across many, many unreliable or untrusted computers. All of the nodes in a consensus protocol replicate some state of a ledger, a database, an application, uh, and in a way that's like reliable, even if some of the nodes that are in part of the network uh, misbehave, uh, they can misbehave in arbitrary ways. As long as there's not too many of them misbehaving, uh, the consensus protocol should still provide a coherent picture of the image of this application state database or ledger. So 
So people use consensus protocols even outside of blockchains. Um, and they've been around for a while, um, although the, uh, the academic literature isn't too deep and wide. Um, they're used in processors, distributed databases, and in flying cars, where basically it's very, very important that uh, the engines agree on the inputs that all the other engines are getting, because if it, and, and are all you know working reliably, even if one of them, even one of the little computers fails, because you don't, you really don't want it to malfunction when you're in the flying car. It's still a made-up example, right? No, no. I, I, I saw like I saw this in the on Discovery Channel. Really? Yeah, <laughs> for real. <laughs> this is before this is before Bitcoin. Yeah, there's probably YouTube. Yeah, drones might use consensus protocols. Who knows? I mean, they should. If, I mean, it's better to have a replicated computer than just one computer if you, you have a, like a really critical application. So traditional consensus protocols are not blockchain-based consensus protocols, uh, and they traditionally only come to consensus when a supermajority of nodes approves of the change. This makes them very safe. We call them forward secure. They like will not fork in the way Bitcoin might. Uh, they, uh, be because of supermajority agrees, uh, before the change occurs, everyone will make the same change. There's not two supermajorities that make two different changes unless there's above a certain amount of faulty nodes. But normal conditions, there's, it doesn't ever fork. So, if and, and these types of consensus protocols, if too many nodes are faulty or just go offline or if there's a network partition, uh, it kind of just stops because it can't guarantee the safety property that the change it's about to make will not be reverted and that clients won't, di won't disagree about it. Blockchains, on the other hand, they, like I mentioned earlier, they come to consensus through compromise. Someone will like propose a block, and then that, that'll cause the client's fork choice rule to pick the blockchain that now includes that block. So people seeing this new block, even without coordinating beforehand to all agree on it, will choose this new fork. And then the consistency comes from the fact that all clients choose the same forks. So forks are blockchains. Every blockchain is a fork, and sometimes you might have two blockchains that share most of the blocks and then there's a few blocks that they don't share and we call them forks because they're kind of forks of the same blockchain. I would like to dwell a little bit on the consequences. I mean, first of all, it's important to see that this traditional consensus protocols was all, that was basically how you would solve this kind of consensus problem. And it has a very strong scalability problem in that it works for tens or a hundred maybe. And then you get a problem that you cannot have an the communication efficient anymore between all the nodes that have to agree before everybody makes a step to a new state in lockstep, but it just slows down to a degree where it's not usable anymore. While Bitcoin from, from the start was designed to have nodes beyond that limit and came up with something here um, that was a completely new paradigm. There was something where researchers beforehand didn't want to go which is like, yeah, let's just risk that we get out of sync. And then just let's try to heal it as good as possible afterwards. And that's exactly what Bitcoin does. And this is why it can do that with 5,000 nodes, where they will disagree pretty often um, who is actually now having the right truth. But it doesn't matter because it's instantly healed as soon as it becomes clear which path seems to be um, the more promising one. But this has also strong consequences because... In, especially in fintech, you might not find it desirable that you go forward with the truth no matter what everybody else might think and are not able to tell even if you're alone in what you think is the truth or at least in a kind of um, sizable minority or whatever and all of a sudden the truth changes. So you never have a 100% guarantee about what is actually the committed state in any given moment. It could just turn out you're on the smaller fork if you if you uh, unlucky, yeah. And although it is important to note that uh, there exist blockchain protocols that do have finality, and there also exist blockchain protocols that don't have this nice property that uh, the overhead is really low, even as you scale the number of nodes up. Um, 
the, the pattern that defines blockchains is the idea of a fork choice rule. Um, and Bitcoin is like only a blockchain. It doesn't involve any coordination, but we're kind of working on blockchains that have also finality and also this property that you come to consensus through compromise. Um, sure. So the characteristic of these blockchains then is that they're, if, there's a, if there's a network partition, um, they will still make their application states available to the clients. Clients will still be able to uh, make a transaction and a block will appear uh, showing them the result of that transaction. They're also uh, more decentralized in this than traditional consensus protocols because uh, to create a change, you don't require permission from a majority. Um, uh, one way to think about it is that uh, the, the size of the center of a network is related to the number of nodes that you have to remove to make it stop. In a fully centralized node, if you remove one node, it stops. Um, with a traditional consensus protocol, if you remove enough nodes to prevent a supermajority from forming, it stops. Um, in a blockchain-based protocol, um, most usually, uh, you have to remove all but one node for it to stop. So economic consensus is this, uh, this other property. So, and, and basically it, it lets nodes who don't trust each other, don't know each other, and aren't set up by a network administrator to, uh, to still come to consensus. And the reason that they do this, uh, the way that they can do this is by kind of knowing that if other nodes were to screw up and act in a way that's bad, it would cost them a lot of money. It's this kind of trust through the fact that we know that everyone has expenses and if they don't make up their expenses, then they're gonna lose money and lose money, losing money is hard for an attacker to do on a massive scale in order to disrupt the network. Hopefully that's clear. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about it more. So economic consensus can be used to provide public utilities. It can be used to provide like really truly public networks that aren't administered. Whereas without economic consensus, you can't really do that because you can't control the composition of nodes without an administrator. Um, we have this trend called like permission blockchains where people want to have like blockchains uh, in a non-economic context and they require like an administrator to say who is allowed to be a node. Um, so, and, and you can use economic consensus in a private context by just insisting that the nodes who you chose to be uh, part of the consensus would lose money if they misbehave. Although, uh, if you own the servers yourself, then that might be you causing yourself a cost. But if you, but if you choose servers, say, across different banks or something, it might make sense to incentivize them to keep these nodes online. And to, to be a little concrete, I mean, that's part of the thing we want to bring across. Um, uh, economic consensus is what is actually used in the moment in Bitcoin and in Ethereum. And even with the changes that will come to Ethereum, it will still be based on economic consensus. And what we're seeing is that um, the approach to have a public blockchain as opposed to private blockchains that, that are also interesting, but for public blockchains in the moment, it's economic consensus. Yeah. And it's also worth noting that the, the reason that Bitcoin was such a success isn't through like amazing use of blockchain technology, but through the fact that it is a public protocol that has economic consensus. I mean, um, blockchains favor availability in the event of network partitions, but, but Bitcoin, which means, which actually ends up meaning that you can, you can make blocks pretty quickly and still come to consensus. But Bitcoin makes blocks every 10 minutes because of the particular architecture. Um, but it's really the, the economic consensus that has generated all this interest in this space. And, and, and thankfully has caused a lot of renewed interest in the consensus space more broadly. So there's a couple of ways that like, we know of to, to do economic consensus. Um, proof of work is, the, is, is Bitcoin's you know, pioneering example which is that uh, what you the strategy is to make the creation of blocks very computationally expensive. And then uh, w what happens is that Bitcoin compensates you for making a block in the correct location. And so everyone ends up making blocks all in a chain together because they only get compensated for that expense if they, if they, create, if they all work together. If, say, um, a, a faulty miner would create a block not on the main chain, they would incur the expense, but they wouldn't be compensated for it. 
and so their fault would be expensive. Uh, and then there's another class of protocols called proof of stake, uh, which tries to use uh, kind of digital assets in the consensus to make faults expensive. Traditionally, proof of stake meant that you'd have to like just buy up coins in order to create blocks, and that that would be expensive for you to do unless, uh, and it would be expensive for you to attack the system because then you would like lose value of your own coins. Um, more modern proof of stake systems use security deposits, where not only do you need to buy out coins, you need to place them in deposits so that the protocol has like direct control over your coins. And if you, uh, if the protocol thinks that you've misbehaved, it will remove some of these coins from you, making you bear this expense. It's uh, it's interesting in that context that um, the stake though uh, does not necessarily only have to be within the system. It's one criticism of proof of stake that it doesn't really help you with any motivation for an attack that is motivated from an outside. Uh, uh, incentive to bring down the whole system. But um, in the context of private blockchains that are interested, interesting for IoT or, or FinTech, um, you see that reputation, for example, or money paid into a bond can equally serve as a stake to give you incentive to behave as a miner or a validator. So now we're going to start going through the projects and saying whether they're blockchain-based, whether they're economic, and getting a nice little discussion about their properties. And hopefully this should clear up kind of the taxonomy of the space for you. Yeah, we, we picked uh, some of the names that um, people will probably be running into. And uh, Bitcoin, we probably don't have to explain. I think Ripple is also um, clear. Stella is, a, is an offshoot from... Uh, from Ripple, if I can say that, um, in the sense that um, it has has a stronger um, social focus, maybe uh, Hyperledger is something uh, in the banking uh, in the banking side. Ethereum, everything, uh, everybody has heard about that, I guess. And yeah, we'll, we'll explain so the rest. So let's just go through it. them. So, so Bitcoin, the first blockchain, is Satoshi Nakamoto's epic creation. And its purpose, stated purpose by, mo by most of the like ardent supporters is to like act as a public currency to disintermediate banks. That's in the white paper also, as stated purpose. So. Oh yeah, okay. Not cool. just the fans. He said, he said it himself. S Satoshi Nakamoto himself. Um, zero cash. It's uh, zero cash is a uh, also a blockchain based protocol and it's basically designed to be anonymous money. Um, it's, it's like Bitcoin's dark cousin. Yeah, it's the only slide we have about zero cash because um, on in many uh, aspects, it's, it's very similar to Bitcoin, that it's, it's an evolution in the direction of really angering the regulators. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ripple is going to replace Swift. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that's a publicly stated goal as well. Is it? Oh, I, I don't know. Um, interestingly enough, though, Ripple is along for a very long time, and it's probably their third or fourth pivot in what they actually want to be. Um, I guess they're they positioned right to, to take them on, but it's not how they started. Okay. And now Stellar. S Stellar is like Ripple, but it's for banking the unbanked. So the kind of the social motivation is different. Protocol is very similar. Hyperledger is a protocol that is designed for banking and a private network that's never been um, made for, oh, that's, that's funnier in Hong Kong than in London, it seems interesting. <laughs> <laughs> for London, I was asked to, to not show a naked um, female belly <laughs> done, but well. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so um, wait a little bit with Hyperledger. Um, Hyperledger has been bought by um, Five Masters company and they are um, successful already in connecting banks in a, with a private network. It's a very simple protocol that is really uh, focused exclusively on the, on the very traditional uh, way to build a communication between different players and it doesn't really care about uh, those more interesting things that even Bitcoin has where a transaction is, is a script. So Ethereum is a public smart contracts platform. What's that? Um, it, it aims to be uh, a, a place where you can program uh, 
functionality into the blockchain using like a, a programming language that programmers are like generally. But Bitcoin has that too. No, it's it's Bitcoin. You have to write into the in the opcodes uh, rather than uh, be able to like write in a higher level language that compiles down to the opcodes. So you could write a high level compiler for Bitcoin and have the same like Ethereum. No, no, you can't. Why not? It's uh, the opcodes have all sorts of weird functionalities. They're okay, it's really fun. Okay. <laughs> Um, Tendermint is also a public smart contract pr a platform, although I think they might be pivoting to do uh, private consensus. Um, they, are ev they have an EVM, uh, and it's, uh, it's notable because they, uh, they're, they're using security deposits uh, as for proof-of-stake protocol. Eris, the goddess of strife. Um, started probably as a clone of um, Ethereum. Um, I was also pivoting away from Ethereum uh, at this moment, if I understand that right. Um. And um, the idea here was to have a focus on making the consensus protocol parametrized so that you could have a special um, customized uh, setup for every individual chain. So now we're basically going to go through them again and providing this like little, little taxonomical kind of quickly saying whether it's private or public, whether you use traditional consensus protocols or blockchain protocols, uh, whether they're just a transaction network or whether they have this kind of smart contract virtual machine environment. Here we go. So now we're recycling those images because they're so cool and it's it's for a purpose because we, we felt like maybe that's a way to really get an understanding in, in a short period of, of time. So next time you run into those different buzz, uh, names, uh, you'd really have a good re uh, rem uh, memory what it's all about. And yeah, so, so Bitcoin. Bi Bitcoin is public, decentralized, and it has a little, it has a bit of scripting. Uh, so we say that, you know, it has this little virtual machine thing. Yeah, it's, it's the blockchain, right? It's, it's what started and, and it's the reference of what a blockchain should be, I guess, even if many people nowadays have their own definitions. Mm -hmm. And it's not often said that it has a virtual machine, but technically it has. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So Ripple is a private transaction network with built-in currency conversions. Um, for the longest time, I actually thought that Ripple is a, uses a traditional consensus protocol. But it turns out that they have a blockchain-based consensus protocol with the fork choice rule. Um, that's, I guess, something that they don't really advertise that much in their in their literature. They, they try to make their consensus seem very safe, but um, it does have the fork choice rule. So if there was a partition, then nodes would disagree. Uh, so uh, that's something to know. But still, uh, in a certain sense, it's not completely decentralized because it works with a whitelisted validator set. So it's not as open. It's not supposed to be as open. It's part of the, the whole um, business idea there that you know who are actually the validators or the miners, however you call them. Stellar, um, it's the same, only it banks the unbanked. <laughs> it really is. It's a fork. <laughs> it's a, a one, right? What do you say? It's not the same? They don't. Cool. Is it blockchain based? Is it, is it safe? No, it's safe, isn't it? Do they have a um, Do they have a, a traditional consensus protocol? Kind of. Uh, I'll, I'll read the paper. <laughs> It'll be federated. Okay. So it st could still be a tr traditional consensus protocol or a blockchain based consensus protocol. It's sort of a hybrid. Okay. I'll read the paper. Sorry about this. Things change. Things change fast in this space. Yeah, Hyperledger is really um, completely based on traditional consensus. It's uh, uh, they are just genius with branding because they call it a blockchain, completely riding on that hype and sell something that absolutely works for the use case that is advertised for. It just it's not really a blockchain, but it doesn't matter. It was the right time to sell it, and they sold it and. Uh, and it works, and it has customers and more traffic than some other blockchains, I guess. Yeah, and they have a real business plan. It's amazing. 
So Ethereum is public, blockchain based, smart contract for platform with a virtual machine. Yes, and I would like to stress that Ethereum like really has a virtual machine that is Turing complete, and it can do all sorts of things, and this is why it can be this blockchain of blockchains. And Tendermint is similar, only um, it uses a traditional consensus protocol, but also has a virtual machine. It's also it's also um, it's also public, although they might be pivoting. Eris has started to work with Tenement. Um, the, the obvious field of research that many people are running into is to see how can we use the technology that's really developed for the public blockchain for a private blockchain. And they found that Tenement is probably uh, researching the same way. Interestingly, uh, Jay, who's doing Tenement, was first trying it that he was uh, using Ethereum and trying to build the Tenement consensus into Ethereum and then pivoted to use the Ethereum VM and build it into Tendermint. Um, while I would say that the VM is probably 90% of a project and the consensus is actually 10. Um, I'm not sure about that. Some people disagree. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say which what's, what's more work when Ethereum has already done the virtual machine and you just import it in. So t talking about um, the virtual machines on the next slide. Um, so smart contracts. Um, we had that uh, earlier, actually need something, some kind of code possibility, and so you have to have a virtual machine, you have to have code that's executed, and you also have to have some kind of cryptocurrency, however you call it, the token of the blockchain, and something that they can actually transact. What they also need, and which is something that I find is generally spoken not enough of, is they need to have some kind of interface to the outside world that actually triggers something that makes them execute whatever the logic is. And that's often called Oracle. Mm. Oracles basically provide uh, information that can't be verified by the contract itself to the contract. So um, classic examples are like price feeds of external assets or the weather in San Francisco. Which is also, w because we had that earlier, which is also the point why it becomes so powerful when you have stock, ex uh, when you have uh, shares issued, for example, or any kind of assets issued directly on the blockchain. Because then you don't need necessarily need an oracle. Then it's all part of that digital world. And that's what makes the things really fast then and really potentially complex. So for smart contracts, um, the interesting thing to see is that we really only deal it with two different VMs. And the Bitcoin VM is not even taken seriously as a VM usually. And the efforts, in my view, to create real smart contracts on top of Bitcoin are heroic, but misguided also. And um, I understand how Peter means it, which basically means he's not here. That's why it's silent. Um, the way that Peter means it, it makes complete sense, of course. Peter understands a lot more of that than I do. Still. What we're seeing here is that we have the Ethereum VM basically being the basis of Ethereum, Tenement, and Eris. Um, and it's the only VM that actually really can give you smart contracts. And this is why um, when you go to a hackathon and give people free choice of uh, any technology they might use and certain kind of smart contract leaning tasks, they all use Ethereum it, it, because it makes sense. And uh, now we're going to go through and say whether each of them are economic again. I mean, this time with. I forgot what I wrote. So, Bitcoin is economic because it makes faults expensive by rec making changes expensive. Ripple is non-economic because the nodes that are ma nodes maintain a trusted nodes list, uh, and faulty behavior isn't punished through uh, direct costs to these nodes. Stellar, just like Ripple, not economic. Hyperledger also non-economic for these like interbank clearing. You know they don't really want to get charged by their own protocol when the node goes down. Um, Ethereum is public and economic. It right now it uses proof of work. Our plan is to switch to proof of stake sometime in the next year to two years. Which interesting is really really different, but also economic. Yeah, definitely definitely economic. Um, Tendermint is also economic. And uh, 
Eris is non-economic, although they're going to be using the Tendermint stack uh, in a non-economic way. So instead of like using security deposits, you just have like the deposit as your permission to produce blocks. So does anybody have any question? Sure. Yeah, just a question about areas. Like this description you gave now is like that. Is that after the recent rebranding or re pivot or whatever you want to call it? Can you say that again? Sorry. If the description of areas is like after the recent rebranding or second pivot or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So areas is after the rebranding. They're they're traditional consensus protocol. It's not economic. Or so okay. And no, the yeah, I was just asking because they ch it changed. Yeah, it times. used to be blockchain based. And now it's uh, now it uses a traditional consensus protocol. Okay, thanks. If you were designing a clearance and settlement system using the technology, would you, for banks, for example, some in the room, would you want to have an economic incentive system where you're actually penalizing people for breaks, an account that can be debited? No. Why not? Um, yeah, we can we can talk about that in length. I'm I'm really interested in that, and anybody is invited. Um, who's also interested in that. Uh, in short, there are existing incentives in, in the business for uh, companies to not behave badly. And it does not really make sense just for the fun of it to create a new incentive on a level that's actually not even as powerful as that you don't want to lose your reputation or have anybody else stop dealing with you. Yeah, so all of the nodes in these one of these bank networks are going to be like known to the banks. They'll be operated by someone that the bank knows, otherwise they wouldn't, you know, pay them for that. Uh, and so, uh, and, and then if you know who this entity is, and you have a legal relationship with them, uh, then you can use, like, legal means for punishing them for uh, being faulty. Or The, maybe the reason I'm asking is in settlement systems like LCH, ClearNet, and DTCC, I believe there are penalties for breaks, and your account can be debited, so that, that's the only reason why I was curious. I, I don't know that. Um, if that's the case, that's also an example though for existing mechanics who are also probably not automatic. We're talking about something that is completely automatic and works with entities that are completely anonymous, which is absolutely not the case about a, when we talk about a private network for interbank clearing. One thing you didn't mention was uh, Chain and its implementation through like APIs. How do you see that in conjunction with things like the virtual machine and your commentary about uh, uh, Ethereum being easier to work with to build apps on top of than, than the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, how, how would you classify the, the, the work that Chain's doing? Yeah, so um, I, I would like to give an allegory there. I think um, it's clear that every, everything that can be done with HTTP can be done with FTP. And I, and that's just my personal belief, but I believe that Having having stuff on the blockchain and having code actually, if not in the blockchain structure itself, but closely associated in state, so that it's kind of part of that state package the nodes send around to each other, is probably it's very likely going to make the difference um, in productivity, in, in robustness, in transparency um, that might be as high as if you would try to implement a web server using FTP. You could do that. Uh, technically, semantically, somehow on some level, it's completely the same. It's just completely not productive. And, and this is why we have HTTP in the first place. And it, within IBM, there was this argument. When HTTP came up, it was like, <laughs> we, didn't, we don't need that. We have FTP, and it's not, it's not adding anything, right? So in this case, uh, although you could say, hey, on, on a certain level, that's, that really absolutely doesn't matter where the actual code is. It's just what matters is that we have the hash on the blockchain. It's still in my view, might make the difference, but I don't know. Uh, I have a very simple question. There was a slide about uh, different parameter choices of different kind of blockchains, and it was gone through very quickly. Could you show it again? And if possible, can you explain how those design choices being chosen in different blockchains that you just uh, show us? Actually, that's pretty much what we did. I mean, those seals that you have there and the text at the bottom, um, that is the application of those uh, differences that we had listed there. Right. 
So these, that's, that's the distinctions you meant, this list? Yeah. So this is very much what we discussed then after, how, how the blockchains, how the different blockchains are uh, similar with that. I, I, I've seen, read something like about permission, permissionless, and there was probably a bunch of others. Um, it was a different slide. No, 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 but read right it from some websites. Uh, uh, is there any other important uh, design choices that um, it's not included yes, here? Yes, there are lots. Yeah. I mean, is, this, this is, is the only taxonomy, or are there are other others? The, the, this is just what we decided to focus on for this talk. You would find, you can endlessly discuss the, the fine nuances, and sometimes in specific use cases, all of a sudden they make huge differences. And, and this is what makes this whole field sometimes like a bit of a minefield. And uh, here we kind of use private versus public to talk about permission versus unpermissioned. Um, permission is kind of one uh, like you know a, a word that people like to use now. I personally prefer private versus public because it kind of just it tells you whether or not there's a network administrator. Right. I um, see. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, um, when you when you use uh, proof of stake, do you stop creating new currency? That depends. If the proof of stake, um, the proof of stake design space is very, very large. Uh, it's kind of up to you as the pro protocol developer. But I thought you don't. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I personally prefer not to because I think issuance is kind of funny economics, where you're you're kind of uh, basically taxing all the holders of the tokens in order to secure the network. Um, but it does make some edge cases potentially uh, less fatal to the network. So if our transaction fees were to drop to zero, if you issue, then it might be more secure than, um, than if you don't issue. I mean, the idea originally comes from having to pay in a stake and then being proving that you have paid for having the allowance to p take part, which then shifted towards, uh, well, we can take the native token, right? And then shifted towards, well, we can as well just hold back the reward for the blocks that you would get. So actually, it became more and more elegant and more and more it, it wasn't about creating actual rewards, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, security deposit-based proof stake is, is based more on like disincentives than incentives. Um, and so, whereas like proof of work fundamentally has to be based on the issuance of, of coins and like this, because the disincentive is extra protocol. Um, so it's kind of perhaps more elegant to use only a small amount of incentive and a lot of disincentive because that way you can make um, faults very expensive only when they occur, rather than making updating the state always expensive and compensating it always. So I'd, I'd like to thank our, our presenters and feel free to come up and ask them any questions. Um, and all our panelists today, Kindar for, for being our MC, Cyberport for hosting us, and actually in particular, um, Perkins Cooey and Brian Cave, um, who have been a part of our, our workshop since the very beginning and, and huge supporters. So, and thank you all for, for standing through. Yeah. Um, and we start at 9.45 tomorrow. We've got a full day, um, a really amazing speakers, um, and um, hope to see you guys there. 9.45, see you tomorrow morning. Have a good evening and enjoy Hong Kong. Um, one quick question. I'm looking for a Bitcoin trade. If anybody wants to buy a Bitcoin, I'm selling one. <laughs>